Good morning, everybody. If I can ask you to uh, take seats, we will, we will start. My name is Wim Wiebel. I'm the president of Portland State University, and I want to welcome you to this meeting in the series that we call Portland State Convenes, in which we've had other events, such as uh, mayoral debate last year and other big meetings on important topics. Uh, this topic uh, of, on student debt, from debt to degree, is certainly an extremely important critical one because the issue of student debt has really come to the fore in the last few years and it's become clear how much of a problem it is for our country and for our students. And because of that, it is a problem for our economy and it's a problem for all of us, not just for those who are incurring debt. National student loan debt has grown to about $870 billion. $870 billion. You always need one of these things where you say, you know, if you put those bills on top of each other, it would stretch from here to the moon or wherever it would stretch. With over 37 million borrowers. And as we've begun to hear, it's beginning to interfere with young graduates being able to do things like uh, buy homes and take other steps to financial self-sufficiency and life success. In Oregon, about 59% of students at our, our public universities graduate with an average debt of $24,000. Now, how did this happen? Well, truly, in terms of the public universities, the student debt crisis has really its roots in the state cuts to higher education that began in the 80s and 90s, in Oregon particularly driven by the changes in the property tax system, the funding requirements for K through 12, and the subsequent decline of funding in higher education. Because what happened is, of course, that the cost of education has shifted from the state to the student. The official numbers are that 20 years ago, the state paid 56% of the cost of education. Now the state pays 21%. Now it's very important, because people always forget about this, that we do not spend any more per student now than we did 20 years ago after just adjusting for inflation. So the problem of rising tuition and student debt is not caused by professors being lazy or administrators who sit around doing nothing or universities building climbing walls and lazy rivers. No, we spend as much now as we did 20 years ago. But what has changed is who pays for that cost. And of course, that's the shift that it used to be the state paying for it through a direct subsidy to the universities. And now it's significantly the students paying for it through their tuition. And that, of course, has then required them to borrow. And that has driven up the debt. Now, the state has begun to take some steps this year the legislature passed the bill that allowed more money into the universities to make up for the tuition increases so that we were able to lower the tuition increase this year to just 2% and to then keep tuition frozen for next year. This is a step forward, but I think everybody, including Representative Mike Dembro, who is here with us, very good to have you here, Representative, knows that this is still only a very much a small step to return to a situation that existed before. We had to begun to see some creative ideas. The pay it forward idea that was developed by a capstone class here at Portland State University and Professor Mary King, I saw her earlier, is here who ran that class together with a colleague and many of the students. Um, and that was uh, looked at by the legislature and, le and we are now studying at a task force is studying to see how that could be implemented to change the way we finance education. And next week, we at Portland State will have a major announcement that will also help students. Stay tuned for that. But the first step to fixing a problem is to acknowledge it and to get the facts straight. Because there is a lot of wrong information or misleading information as well. The first very important inf piece of information is that higher education is still a great investment. People with a college degree will earn about a million dollars more over a lifetime than people, than people with just a high school degree. So if you indeed finish your degree, you go on to get that job, then borrowing money is a very good investment. 
Also, because if you have a college degree, even during the recession, the unemployment for people with a college degree was only 4%, whereas for people with just a high school degree, it was 16%. So your chances of having a good job are just much greater with that college degree. Also remember that if 59% graduates with debt, it means that 41% graduates without debt because their parents pay for it, they pay for it themselves while they're in, in school through working. So this is not a universal. Also, the numbers we hear about high student debt, only 1% of students borrows more than $100,000. So I kind of compare that to the story that used to make the rounds about you know, the welfare mother who drove a Cadillac. You know, they may well have been a welfare mother somewhere who drove a Cadillac, but that was not a very helpful description of the issue of welfare in America. So we've got to know what the facts are and focus on those. But even getting all those facts straight, we have a real problem and a serious problem, and we need to address it. And today, we're going to discuss it. Because what if you don't graduate? What if you're a first generation student and you and your family are kind of nervous about this idea of borrowing money because you don't really have in your family the experience of somebody with a degree getting a good job. So having to rack up debt, having to pay that kind of high tuition is likely to scare people away, which exactly destroys the purpose of providing access, of trying to get more people with college degrees. So that's why we have to address this problem. Today you're going to hear from two nationally respected experts on student debt. You're going to hear the concerns of students and parents, and we're going to develop a call, of act call to action for moving forward. And you're going to hear some tips on how to make college more affordable on your own. We're organizing this forum with our colleagues at the Oregon University System because we are committed to finding ways to make it more affordable to go to college, and we need your help to make it so. We also want to thank our sponsors today, Incepcia and USA Funds, two companies that work with people to make it possible to go to college. Now, for the rest of the program, and for your moderator this morning, please join me in welcoming KG, KGW anchor Tracy Berry. Tracy. Good morning, you guys. Hey, you're probably wondering what those little clicker things are. Well, it's not to change the channel, people. You're stuck with me. You cannot make me disappear by pushing that. But um, a little later on, we're going to do some questions, it's like pass or fail. They're not that hard. But you'll be choosing on your clickers. We hope you'll participate in a, a little survey about college costs and some things like that. So that's what those are for. Don't take them home. Um, Thank you so much for inviting me here today. As the mother of two daughters, I was thrilled to hear that we're going to solve this issue today, right? <laughs> well, we're going to give it a shot anyway. I mean, we've got a few hours, so let's go for it. Because I don't want to end up like the guy who, um, I don't know if you heard about this, but he embezzled $100,000. And when they asked him why, he said it was to pay for his daughter's education. And when they came to arrest him, the police officer just had one question for him. He said, so where were you planning to get the rest of the money? I know, I know. It's all I could find, seriously. There is no, there's no jokes about college costs. And that's because it's not funny, is it? Gosh, when you look at those statistics about, you know, an average graduate being $25,000 in debt right out of the gate, I mean, I think at my first job, okay, it was a long time ago. But uh, I think I made $16,000 that first year out of college. If I'd had a $25,000 debt, I don't even know how that would have worked out, but not very well. And student debt now outpaces credit card debt, uh, which is frightening because you know how high credit card debt is. So there is not much to laugh about when it comes to this. But luckily today, we have someone who is absolutely the guru on this subject. His bio is so impressive, I'm not even sure where to begin. I couldn't absolutely read it all to you, or we would be here all day and we would never get to him. But he is uh, 
Mark Kantrowitz, and he's a nationally recognized expert on financial aid, scholarships, and student loans. In the past five years, he's been quoted in more than 5,000 newspapers and articles, and I think that beats the Kardashians, seriously, which is impressive. One of my favorite honors that he got, though, I was just scanning through, there's like a zillion. He was named a money hero by Money Magazine. And I say, if you can figure out how to fix this mess, we'll get you the cape, seriously. And he is indeed a hero to many families and students because his mission is to deliver really practical information and advice about planning and paying for college. And that would be enough, but then I did what any good reporter does these days. I Googled him. And uh, some really interesting tidbits popped up. This one from the Chronicle of Higher Education. That was like, you know, page 12 on the Google results. And um, I could only read the first paragraph because it's a publication that you have to subscribe to. And of course, I can't afford it because I'm saving for college, right? But that first paragraph was worth it. And it must be true because that's such a good source. It says, Mark Kantrowitz breeds hairless cats, solves complicated math problems, collects aboriginal art, restores early battery-operated toys, and folds elaborate origami. So I quickly begged my 10-year-old, since I have no skills, to come up with a little something to welcome you. And so she made you a little origami top, and it's fancy. Oh, there we go. Okay, it's a top because he's at the top of his game. Please welcome Mark. Well, thank you for that uh, glowing introduction, and I'm sure my kids will really enjoy this top. It's a nice piece of unit origami. Okay, so I, I tend to be a bit of a numbers person. Uh, I, I like to look at data and form opinions from data. So you'll find this talk includes a lot of uh, numbers and charts. But I'm going to talk a bit about the myths about paying for college and college affordability and trends in student loans and the reality. And the myth may be more extreme, but the reality is still pretty uh, uh, dismal in, in many ways. So the, the myth that uh, the college president uh, uh, um, referenced was that uh, students graduate with six-figure debt from undergraduate school. Uh, bachelor degree recipients, only about 0.2 percent of them graduate with six-figure student loan debt. But there's been so much coverage of this in uh, news media, though not in uh, the Oregon newspaper, uh, that people believe, I and mean, I talk to people on the street and say, oh, everybody, you can't possibly graduate from undergraduate school without six-figure debt. Uh, the New York Times had three different articles about different students graduating with six-figure debt, as did the Wall Street Journal. Uh, there have been articles in Business Weeks, on CNN, Huffington Post, Money Magazine, NPR, San Francisco Chronicle, as well as the New York Times and Wall Street Journal. And this gives this impression that there's, uh, debt is completely out of control. Uh, the reality is that 90% of students who graduate with six-figure debt uh, are graduating from graduate and professional degree programs. Uh, students pursuing a law degree, about 36% of them graduate with student loan debt in the six figures, 49% of medical school graduates with six figure debt. Uh, and um, it does, uh, and it's, it's difficult to do this on federal loans alone because on an undergraduate level, the maximum you can borrow from the federal Stafford loan program is 57,500. So to graduate from undergraduate school with six-figure debt, you'd have to be borrowing from a private student loan program or the Parent PLUS loan program. Uh, and <clears throat> the students who, who borrow from private student loan programs are much, much more likely to graduate with six-figure debt. So while very few students are graduating with six-figure debt, uh, and the college affordability problem isn't as bad as most people believe, it is still bad and it's getting worse. So uh, student loan debt is growing much faster than income. Uh, income has been relatively flat for the last decade, while student loan debt increases by about $1,000 a year. 
uh, the burden of paying for college has shifted from the federal and state government to families. Uh, it is not uncommon for politicians to uh, talk about legislation as the biggest increase in student aid since the GI Bill. Well, the GI Bill was in the 1950s when college costs a lot less. And uh, the, if you look at it on a constant dollar per student basis, uh, both the federal and state governments have been cutting their support of post-secondary education. That shifts more the burden onto the families. Family incomes haven't increased, so the only way that they can meet the increase in costs is to borrow. And that shifts more the burden on the families. The other consequence of uh, the failure of grants to keep pace with increases in college costs uh, is a shift in enrollment patterns. Low and moderate income families are increasingly shifting their enrollment from bachelor degree programs to certificate and associate degree programs because they require a smaller share of family income. Now, there have been several milestones that have been reached. In 2010, total student loan debt outstanding exceeded total credit card debt outstanding. In 2011, auto loan debt outstanding. In 2012, a uh, trillion dollars in both federal and private student loans. Earlier this year, the federal loans alone hit the trillion dollar mark. But this helped draw news media attention to the debt problem. Before uh, 2010, stories about credit cards significantly outnumbered stories about student loan debt. Today, it's the opposite, and this had an impact on that. It also drew the attention of politicians to the issue, and they're trying to do something about the problem. Uh, but it, what's more important is to look at the impact on individual students. Uh, about one-third of students graduating this past year with bachelor's degrees had enough student loan debt to be in a 20-year or longer repayment plan. That doesn't mean that they chose it. We don't have any statistics on the distribution of repayment plans. Uh, but it does mean that they could have chosen. And there's some evidence that suggests that most students choose the lowest monthly payment, which is usually the longest repayment term. That means that these students, when their children go to college, their parents will still be repaying their own student loans. They will have been less likely to have saved for their children's college education. They'll be less willing to borrow from parent plus loan programs because they'll still be up to their eyebrows in debt. And more and more students are graduating with uh, excessive debt. Uh, there's no uh, official definition of what it means to be excessive. Uh, but I would argue that if it takes more than 10 years to repay the debt, it's excessive. And that suggests that uh, if your total student loan debt is greater, if your monthly loan payment is greater than 10% of your gross income, uh, or if your total debt graduation is greater than your annual starting salary, you're probably graduating with excessive debt. Now, this graph shows what happened with credit card debt in the green and student loan debt in the red. Student loan debt outstanding increases very steadily. Each year you have a new crop of students uh, and uh, they're taking on more and more debt. In September of 2008, uh, the credit card debt turned the corner because of the credit crisis. Uh, lenders uh, adopted stricter credit underwriting criteria, uh, which is not something that's done with student loans, uh, with, with federal student loans at least, private student loans there is, was some change. Uh, and they also increased the minimum monthly payment from about 2% of the outstanding balance to about 4% of the outstanding balance, causing it to decline. If it weren't for this sh shift in the credit card debt, uh, student loan debt would still have eventually exceeded credit card debt, but it would have taken to the year 2020 instead of uh, in the year 2010. Now, when we look at the impact on individual students, the debt-to-income ratio uh, for bachelor degree recipients within uh, the decade after they graduate uh, has gone from about a third of uh, income to about half. And th this data stops at 2007-08 because the latest data is not yet fully available. But uh, th this certainly makes, uh, means that debt is an increasing burden on recent college graduates. Uh, and as we can see in this chart, if we look at excessive debt, and it doesn't matter what definition I use for excessive debt, it shows the same trend, which is the percentage of students graduating with excessive debt has increased pretty significantly from 2.3% in 1992-93 to 12.4% in 2007-08, and it's probably a little bit higher now. Uh, so more students are uh, struggling with uh, how to pay back their loans. Now, the other counterpoint to this is that it's only about 10%. All this talk of us being in a student loan bubble uh, in, 
is uh, a little bit misleading. I mean, we wouldn't be in a bubble until about a third of college graduates were struggling to repay their loans. Uh, and here we are at about um, less than a sixth. Uh, so it's, it's not yet a bubble. But if we fast forward 20 years from now, we may very well be in a student loan bubble then. And the time to deal with it, to make college more affordable, is now. And having uh, the prospect of borrowing hurts low-income student enrollment. Uh, currently, most colleges have a high-cost, high-aid model. They charge a lot, but they give a lot back in the form of grants. And the at private colleges, the average uh, grant gives back uh, about 40% of the gross tuition revenue. Uh, but this has a chilling effect on the enrollment by low-income students. Uh, and this has um, deleterious effects on their graduation rates. For example, the, if we look at six-year bachelor degree attainment rates, I mean, the ideal is to graduate in four, but let's see uh, what the impact is over six years. It, it correlates very strongly with the percentage of college costs met with grants for low- and middle-income students, but not for high-income students. So uh, if we look at the percentage of students graduating six years who have uh, a quarter or less of their college costs met with grants, among low-income students, it's 45%. If we look at the percentage that have more than three-quarters met with grants, it's 68%. That's a 23 percentage point increase. For middle-income families, it shifts from 65% to 88%, also a 23-point increase. For high-income families, it increases from 78% to 79%, only a one percentage point increase. So clearly, we should not be awarding gift aid grants uh, to high-income families because it doesn't make much of a difference in whether they graduate, but it makes a much greater impact on mid uh, low- and middle-income families. Um, and the, we, if you look at the percentage of college-capable low-income students who go to college and graduate from college, it's one-quarter the rate of high-income students, equally college-capable high-income students. Um, and imagine uh, if you were asked to borrow more for your college education than your parents earn in a year. Now, this next chart in the dark blue shows Pell Grant recipients, which is a good proxy for low-income students. The lighter blue is non-recipients. And what we can see, the chart on the left shows that Pell Grant recipients, the low-income students, are graduating with about $3,000 more in debt on average than the wealthier students and that among associate degree recipients, they are twice as likely to graduate with debt, and among uh, the bachelor degree recipients, they're about three quarters more likely to graduate with debt. Not quite double, but still a very significant increase. So we're expecting our poor people to borrow more and to be more dependent on debt than the wealthier people, uh, and it should be exactly the opposite. Okay. Uh, the net price is um, what's left over after you subtract grants from the total cost of a college education. Uh, and this is just looking at one year uh, net price as a percentage of total family income, both taxable income and untaxable income. And the point that I've highlighted here is that everybody struggles to pay for a college education and low income students struggle more than middle income students who struggle more than high income students. They're paying a, and the poorer you are, the greater the percentage of your income goes to college costs. But here, a low-income student to attend a community college pays a greater share of family income than a middle-income student to attend a private nonprofit four-year college. Uh, and this has an impact on the enrollment patterns of the low-income students. And as this chart shows, the, uh, it's probably very hard to read. The x-axis shows income from zero income all the way up to 200,000 or more in income. As income increases, the likelihood of being enrolled in a bachelor degree program increases, uh, and the likelihood of being in a certificate or associate degree program decreases. Or if you look at it the opposite way, the poorer you are, the, you're going to shift your enrollment from the bachelor degree programs to the uh, certificate and associate degree programs. Uh, and these are students who could benefit from having a bachelor's degree, but they're increasingly being priced out of a college education. 
Now, this chart shows what are called default rates or cohort default rates. It takes one group of students, follows them for two years after they enter repayment to see whether they default. And you may have heard in the news that default rates have gone up. They've been going up for the past uh, six years, and they just reached 10 percent. So that's 10 percent of recent college graduates defaulted on the loans within two years of graduating, and this includes uh, students who drop out, and you heard the statistic earlier that students who drop out are four times more likely to default on their student loans than students who graduate. And part of that is that students who graduate go through exit counseling where they learn about their repayment options, whereas students who drop out don't go through that kind of uh, counseling. Uh, and the what we can see from this graph, the line in red is the cohort default rate. We're about back up to where we were uh, in the early 1990s before the, um, when the current default rate uh, regime was put into place that said that a college that had more than 40% uh, default rate in any single year or more than 25% a year for three years in a row lost eligibility for federal aid. And that started in the uh, late 19. Uh, 80s, early 1990s, when the default rate was more than twice what it was, is today, they essentially kicked a whole bunch of schools out of the system. Um, but what we can also see is that the number of students borrowing has increased significantly. And that blue line, that spike that you see, was uh, in 2005 and 2006 when the uh, early repayment status loophole gave students an opportunity to lock in the interest rates on their student loans as low as 2.88%. What that did is it caused borrowers to, uh, who are going to be in later cohorts to shift to earlier cohorts to take advantage of this because they could uh, consolidate their loans and lock in that interest rate uh, while they were still in school. So w this had an impact. So the data that we see on default rates since that point is a little bit questionable. We don't know to what extent it's due to the default rates genuinely increasing or whether it's due to the fact that interest rates increased and that the borrowers who didn't take advantage of this loophole, uh, who maybe weren't paying as much attention, were left in their original cohorts, and those are the borrowers who are more likely to default on their loans. Now, part of the reason for the growth in debt is that more students are applying for financial aid. This chart shows that the number of free application for federal student aids, which is the main form used to apply for money from the federal government, from the state government, and from most colleges, uh, has almost doubled from 2004 uh, to the present. Um, and what's driving this is obviously the economic downturn uh, and sustained unemployment. It's causing many people who thought that they had everything dealt with and they didn't need financial aid to suddenly uh, need money to help pay for college. Uh, and much of this growth is not among the low-income students. It's among middle and upper-income students whose parents thought that they had a, they saved for college and a 529 college savings plan, but along came 2008 when the S&P 500 went down by 39 percent. If they were in an all-stock fund, they lost two-fifths of their uh, savings for their children's college education. They may have been a two-income family and then one parent or maybe both parents lost their jobs and all of a sudden they had to adjust to a lower uh, income and lifestyle. Um, but this uh, certainly has been a key driver of increases in the amount of debt at graduation. So now I'm going to switch to some practical tips for students and parents and also for the educators to teach their students about uh, how to deal with debt. And first I'm going to talk about minimizing debt. The first thing is that you should keep your debt in sync with your income after graduation. Uh, your total student loan debt at graduation should be less than your annual starting salary and ideally a lot less. And if you recall the first slide, one of the first slides, I showed that the average debt to income ratio right now is about one to two, meaning that the average debt at graduation is about half of the starting salaries. That's what, where you want to be. Uh, or even le less than that. Um, and you don't treat loan limits as targets. Uh, you should try to borrow less. I mean, borrow the minimum that you need, not what you can. Uh, and if your total student loan debt is less than your annual starting salary, you'll be able to repay the debt in 10 years or less. Uh, if the debt exceeds your annual income, you're going to struggle to make those loan payments, and you'll need alternate repayment plans like extended repayment or income-based repayment to afford those monthly loan payments. 
And to get an estimate of how much your debt will be at graduation, multiply your first year debt by four. It'll be within 15% of the actual figure. And you can look up salary uh, statistics on a variety of websites like salary.com, payscale.com, bls.gov. Um, you should, um, a similar rule applies to parents. You shouldn't borrow more than you can afford to repay by the time you retire or in 10 years, whichever comes first. Uh, and that will ensure that uh, your total student loan, parent loan debt for all your children is less than your annual income. Now, needing to borrow from the private student loan programs or parent plus loan programs may be a sign that you're over borrowing for your education. Uh, you should also save money by borrowing from the federal loan programs first, I mean, borrow federal first, because the federal loans are cheaper, more available, and have better repayment terms than private student loans. Uh, they, federal loans offer income-based repayment uh, as a good safety net. They also have more generous deferments and forbearances, which are temporary suspensions of the obligation to repay the debt. They also offer public service loan forgiveness, which is not available uh, through private student loan programs. Um, and it's also worth emphasizing that the federal loans, such as the unsubsidized Stafford loan and the Parent PLUS loan, do not depend on financial need, even though you have to file the free application for federal student aid to obtain them. And you can be very wealthy and still get these low-cost loans. Uh, often find that families think, oh, that's only for poor students. It's for everybody. Uh, you should uh, try to uh, pay the interest on unsubsidized loans while the student's in school. That will reduce the amount of debt at graduation by about one-sixth to one-fifth. Uh, it's literally cheaper to save than to borrow. If you were to save $200 a month for 10 years at 6.8% interest, uh, you'd accumulate about $34,433. Uh, if instead of saving that money, you were to borrow it and pay it back over 10 years at 6.8% interest, which was until recently the interest rate on the unsubsidized Stafford loan, uh, you would uh, pay $396 a month, literally twice as much. Uh, and every dollar you borrow will cost you about $2 by the time you pay back that debt. So before you spend student loan money on anything, ask yourself if you'd still pay, buy it, if it at twice the price. Uh, because that's realistically what it's going to cost you if you were uh, to uh, spend student loan money on it. For example, if you buy a pizza a week, and half of your college costs are not uh, in the tuition and fees, but in the living expenses and the textbooks and the uh, eating out. And you're paying for a room and board, uh, but the, uh, you don't like the cafeteria food, so you eat out. Or you get uh, specialty coffees every day or sodas from vending machines. Spending $10 a week on a pizza uh, over a four-year college career is $2,000. If you use student loan money to pay for it, it'll cost you about $4,000. That's a lot of pizza, and that contributes to the cost of the education. Uh, an another alternative to debt is to use tuition installment plans. Many colleges offer these, which instead of having long-term student loan debt, they uh, have you um, pay back the tuition in equal monthly installments over a nine or 10-month period, in some cases a 12-month period. Because some families, they can afford to pay the bill, they just can't do a lump sum. So if you spread it out uh, into monthly installments, it's, it's more affordable. And that helps you avoid the interest that comes with long-term uh, student loan debt. Uh, and after you graduate, if you have loans that have different interest rates, one's at 6.8%, one's at 3.86%, you should target the loan with the highest interest rate for earlier repayment, if you can, pay it off more quickly because that'll save you more money in the long term. So uh, other tips for cutting college costs. Um, and in general, the, the theme is to live like a student while you're in school, so you don't have to live like a student after you graduate. Uh, for example, um, and you can buy used textbooks. Uh, that'll save you about half the cost of new textbooks. Or you sell your textbooks back to the bookstore at the end of the semester. Uh, you could try living at home with your parents. Better to live at home while you're in school than to be forced to live at home after you graduate because you can't afford to rent an apartment or buy a house. Uh, students who graduate with too much debt are more likely to delay life cycle events such as buying a car, buying a house, getting married, having children saving for retirement, and uh, 
to complete the full circle, saving for their children's college education. Uh, another tip is you could work part-time during the school year, and I emphasize part-time as opposed to full-time, because if you work too much, it takes away too much time from academics and has an impact on your academic performance. In particular, students who work one to 12 hours a week will actually have a little bit better academic performance than students who don't work at all, because it forces you to learn time management skills. But if you compare that to students who work 40 or more hours a week, uh, the graduation rates are halved. That means that instead of 60% graduating within six years, you have 32% graduating within six years for bachelor degree recipients. For associate's degree recipients, it's 13% uh, versus 22%. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's, it's clearly uh, working too much uh, takes away too much time from focusing on the real purpose of a college education, which is to get an education. Uh, not to work, not to party, uh, and try to graduate on time. I, the, many students take longer than four years to obtain a bachelor's degree, uh, and there are a lot of things that contribute to this. One is I mean, switching majors or transferring from one college to another uh, reduces, and it, it adds about uh, one to two semesters to the time it takes to graduate, and that adds one or two semesters of college costs. Uh, you can try to get credits by taking various uh, tests like AP tests, CLEP and PEP tests, or taking classes during the semester, during the summer, but make sure that those classes, the credits you earn, will transfer, ask the college for their articulation agreement, which says, does this count just for general credit, or does it count in place of a particular course? And the, as soon as you arrive on college campus, you should plan your path from matriculation to completion. Uh, what classes are you, you going to take when? Because some classes have prerequisites. Uh, some classes uh, are offered only once every two years. So you need to figure out when you're going to be taking the classes. Otherwise, you may be in your senior year and you need one class that isn't going to be offered until next year. And that causes you uh, to have to take an additional semester or two. Um, and you should always, always, always apply for financial aid. File the FAFSA every year, even if you didn't get any aid the previous year, because there are a lot of subtle aspects of the formula that can affect how much aid you get. For example, if you go from one child in college to two children in college, that may have a very significant impact on eligibility for need-based aid because the parental contribution is divided by the number of children in school. In other words, if you have two kids in school, that doesn't mean you have twice as much money to pay for a college education. So the formula is just to accommodate. Okay. So another uh, tip that's worth emphasizing is if you have any unusual family financial circumstances, appeal for more financial aid. This is usually called a professional judgment review or financial aid appeal or special circumstances review. And it's driven by documentation. You want to provide the school with documentation of the unusual circumstance. And what's an unusual circumstance? That's anything that changed from last year to this year, or anything that sets you apart from the typical family. For example, if you lost your job or had a salary reduction, that's a special circumstance. If you had high unreimbursed medical or dental expenses, uh, expenses for a special needs child, uh, private K-12 tuition for siblings, those are all unusual circumstances that it's up to the school, but it can justify their making an adjustment to the amount of financial aid you receive to compensate for the financial impact of those special circumstances. Now I'm going to discuss the uh, pay it forward proposal uh, a little bit. I mean, overall, I like the idea of the pay it forward proposal um, because low income students perceive this kind of an obligation differently than they perceive uh, student loan debt because it shifts the risk of failure from the student to the person providing the funds. If with student loans, you're stuck with them even if you can't get a good job. Uh, with uh, the pay it forward proposal, it adjusts to your income. So if you don't get a good job, you're not paying as much. And that seems to have an impact on the willingness of low income students who are very risk averse to pursue a college education. I mean, they don't have backup plans. They don't have a rich uncle who can uh, provide them with the money uh, if the tuition goes up by $1,000. And even $250 difference in the cost to the family can have an impact on whether the student 
uh, persist in the next year or drops out. Uh, and I also like the fact that it provides an incentive to finish on time because your repayment obligation is greater the longer it takes you to finish. But I think this is very much a work in progress and a lot of details need to be worked out. Uh, there are a lot of uh, miscalculations and practical problems that need to be addressed. Uh, it doesn't consider the impact of tuition inflation on this mix. So it might work right now, but 10 years from now, 20 years from now, it will not necessarily make economic sense for the state. Uh, it doesn't consider the cost of the startup funding. Uh, a bond issue to fund it until it reaches a steady state uh, adds significantly to the cost and it's not accounted for in the proposal. 3% over a 24 year period, 3% of income over 24 years, uh, probably does not provide enough money. It probably costs only about half of the, the cost. Something, something like 6% over 24 years or 10% over 10 years is much more realistic. Uh, if you do out the math and you calculate all of the costs that are associated with it. There's also some practical problems. I and mean, I hear Oregon has problems collecting uh, income tax from its residents. I and mean, how will they be able to collect uh, this additional burden from all of the residents? I and mean, how does it affect out of state and international students? If an alumnus moves out of state, uh, Oregon has no power to compel, uh, they can't. Uh, in, increase your state income tax burden if you're not paying state income tax. Uh, so how will they be able to collect the payments uh, from students who move to other states or even out of the country? It also, in a way, gives an incentive for students who are earning higher income uh, to move out of state to avoid the repayment obligation. So it could contribute to a brain drain from Oregon, uh, despite Oregon being known for being the uh, IP and intellectual property capital of the United States. Uh, also, I mean, even though this is being characterized as not a loan, most states would regulate it as a loan. Uh, and so even if you can uh, collect the payments from students who live in a different state, uh, most of those states would uh, consider it as violating usury laws. Uh, and so uh, the ability to collect would be uh, impacted. Okay. Also, I'm from, I've done extensive uh, interviews with students about uh, the, uh, what they consider to be reasonable in terms of a debt obligation. I mean, also, another problem with the, the proposal is it might not qualify for the student loan interest deduction because there's no interest per se. Uh, so it's unclear uh, whether students borrowing uh, through that uh, pay it forward would uh, be able to get that benefit that are available to students who borrow federal or private student loans. But when I talk to students, 24 years is far too long. Even 20 years, which is what uh, the pay as you earn repayment proposal um, that's actually now effective um, in, uh, has for uh, the forgiveness of remaining debt. Uh, it, they, they even consider 10 years, which is the duration of the repayment obligation under the public service loan forgiveness program to be too long. Uh, but uh, that seems to be more, much more reasonable. Uh, students don't want to be in uh, essentially a form of indentured servitude for more than two decades. Keep in mind, many of these students haven't yet lived 24 years. So the idea of ha being in debt for the, an, a period that's equal to their, I mean, their age right now is, is mind-boggling to them. Uh, and this only covers tuition. It doesn't cover living expenses. It doesn't cover necessarily textbooks. So the students will still have to borrow for some college costs. So it doesn't really eliminate the debt. It just reduces the debt but changes the form of some of the debt into where instead of paying a, a fixed dollar amount, you're paying a fixed percentage of income. Uh, it's not really fair to students who borrow very little but need a little bit, uh, such as uh, low-income students who are getting almost all of their financial need covered by grants. Uh, or high-income students who don't need very much debt. Uh, it's also, I mean, after they graduate, students who have a very high income will be paying a much greater dollar amount than students who have a relatively low income. Uh, when Yale tried this as an experiment uh, a few decades ago, uh, they stopped it specifically because of complaints from alumni about, I mean, they did better uh, in terms of income because of their accomplishments, not necessarily entirely due to the education. They felt uh, upset about 
uh, the, the fact that they were paying so much and that they were subsidizing uh, students who pursued majors in uh, lower paying fields of study. Now, some of the lower paying fields of study, you, know, you can justify it from a public policy point of view, like we need more elementary school teachers. Uh, but uh, some of the other uh, low paying fields, uh, why are, is this, we need to consider, is this a policy that we want to subsidize these fields? I mean, do we need to have uh, women's studies or religious studies or basket weaving uh, or um, uh, history or sociology as fields that receive a subsidy compared to the technological fields like science, technology, engineering, mathematics, healthcare. It's a question that needs to be considered and, and addressed. Um, the, uh, the other thing is that there already is something sort of like this, and it's called income-based repayment. It's actually three different versions of it, income contingent repayment, income-based repayment, and pays your earn repayment uh, from federal education loans, where you're paying a percentage of your discretionary income uh, as opposed to a percentage of your overall income. Uh, and it's not clear whether the Pay It Forward proposal is providing students with a, a better deal. Uh, it also doesn't address the existing problem where you have a trillion dollars in existing student loan debt. They aren't going to be able to pay a percentage of their income except through, if they have federal loans, through the income-based repayment plan. It also doesn't address the fundamental causes of increasing college costs, uh, which as uh, President, uh, um, I don't pronounce his name correctly, uh, Vival, um, uh, as said earlier, um, in cuts in state support of post-secondary education are the primary driver of public college tuition inflation. Uh, and among the nonprofit colleges, uh, there is, uh, it's the mix of costs, uh, in heavy to equipment, energy, facility costs, as well as the discounting effect or multiplier effect that comes from awarding uh, institutional grants. Uh, and so those are problems that are going to cause college costs to continue to increase year after year, uh, and there, there isn't any clear way of addressing it other than the federal and state government reversing the trend towards cutting their support on a per capita basis of post-secondary education and investing more. In fact, I would like to see us not just reverse that trend and have the grants keep pace with increases in college costs. I think what we need to do as a nation is to double or even triple the Pell Grant to make college much more affordable. Uh, that could potentially lead to a new renaissance. And if you were to double the maximum Pell Grant or the average Pell Grant, you'd have about 400,000 more students graduating with bachelor degrees per year. Uh, those students pay more than twice the federal income tax of students who have just a high school diploma. So forget about all the societal good. Just from a purely financial perspective, it is worthwhile for the federal government to invest more in post-secondary education because it pays dividends. The payback period for the increase in the Pell Grants is a decade. Most people work for 40 years. So that means there would be 30 years of pure profit to the federal government, which might even lead to less pressure on the uh, tax rates. They might even be able to cut tax rates if they were to have more people graduating with bachelor's degrees. So, uh, and we really need to shift the burden of paying for college uh, more back to the federal and state governments uh, and less towards the families because uh, they are benefiting as much, if not more, than the individual students. So, uh, thank you. Do we have Hi, Mary King. I have less of a question than a couple of points, and that is I don't think anybody thinks pay it forward is a silver bullet, but maybe something better that we can do at the state level. We don't currently much have a very functional federal government. I don't think anyone would argue that we wouldn't be better off raising Pell Grants significantly. But I would just say a few points. I mean, I think you have very accurately captured fears about pay it forward, and there are the kinds of things that would need to be thought through by the Higher Education Coordinating Committee, which is currently working on it under Tim Nesbitt's direction, who's here. 
But you know, the legislation in the state of Oregon called for maintenance of effort by the state and hopefully increases by the state. And people who are working on this are working with the federal government, our Senator Jeff Merkley, to see if the uh, IRS couldn't be the agency that collected payments, which would obviate the issues of people moving out of state, or that kind of thing. So there are, I won't hog the mic, but I will say that the concerns you have addressed about pay it forward are real, but they are not things that people have not thought about and are not taken into consideration as they craft the proposal here in Oregon. Thank you. I, I agree. Uh, I, I think that uh, the problem, though, is that there's been a lot of hype about it eliminating debt and being the solution to the student loan debt crisis. I think it needs a lot more work, and I understand that more work is being done. Uh, another model that you might want to look at is there was a proposal by Representative uh, Petri uh, called the IDEA loans, which would uh, have the federal government collecting the student loan payments similar to the tax system. Uh, and it would m essentially mandate that everybody be in some kind of an income-based repayment plan. Uh, the IDEA loans, it would be similar to the current income-based repayment plan, uh, but instead of uh, forgiving debt after 25 years in repayment, it would simply cap the interest that accrues once the total interest exceeded 50% of the original amount borrowed, no more interest would accrue. But it still has the problem of potentially being an indentured servitude. Hi, I was just interest, interested in finding out uh, what your sources and references were for your assertion that low-income students perceive pay it forward as a way to mitigate risk of failure. Uh, specifically, where's the data for that? Okay. Well, and there were a couple of predecessors. Uh, there was a company that originally called I Am Power and then later My Rich Uncle. There's Lumni and uh, a couple other attempts at this, and uh, they experienced that uh, when they showed this, tested this with low-income students, uh, they found that uh, the low-income students were much more willing to take on this than they were to take on student loan debt. It was a, a surprising fact. Uh, it's not um, in, uh, a very large statistically significant study. It's more anecdotal in nature, but it does suggest that uh, in the fear of having more debt at graduation than your parents earn in a year uh, has a chilling effect on enrollment. I mean, there's been a couple of studies from the Advisory Committee on Student Financial Assistance that tend to support this. Uh, I think there, there was a study in 2006 called The Rising Price of Inequality that has a lot of good data. Uh, and uh, it, it does have uh, a, a deleterious effect on enrollment patterns by the low-income students. Uh, they get scared away by the sticker price. They get scared away by the prospect of borrowing debt. If they have any experience with debt, it's usually negative experience. I think we have time for one more question, if someone has one. Any more questions? Right there. You made the point about the importance of shifting the burden of support back to the federal government. If you were to choose between more state Uh, I think that the money should track with the student because that gives the colleges more of an incentive to attract the students and there are the eight dollars that travel with them. Uh, I think that there is a problem with the current need analysis system. Uh, there are some financial aid that is pegged to financial need, uh, like the subsidized Stafford loan, whereas the uh, Pell Grant is pegged only to the expected family contribution. So the a low income student is going to get uh, perhaps a full Pell Grant, regardless of which college they enroll in, whereas a wealthy student can get a subsidized Stafford loan by attending a more expensive institution. And I'm not sure we need to be subsidizing colleges to have higher uh, college costs. I don't agree with the assertions that uh, the financial aid causes increases in college costs. I mean, they certainly uh, make the college more affordable despite the increases in costs. But nobody in their right mind believes that a $5,000 Pell Grant causes a college to charge $50,000 a year. But still, I mean, we, we need to ha perhaps have market forces have more of an impact on helping colleges to moderate the cost. Uh, for example, right now, when you apply for, federal, for student aid, 
uh, for admission, you're applying with, before you know how much the college is actually going to cost you. Now, the net price calculators are an attempt to give you a sense before the fact, but what would be better is to have you apply for financial aid before you apply for admissions to see if you can afford that college. Uh, there's a proposal out there that's being studied called prior prior year. Rather than basing financial aid on last year's income, use two-year-old income so that you can apply for financial aid when you're a high school junior. And uh, while that won't be necessarily as accurate as using current data, the current prior year system where you're using last year's data as a proxy for this year's data is also inaccurate. And uh, the, there's an open question whether two-year-old data is any more inaccurate than one-year-old data. Now, if you imagine a world in which students were able to see whether the college was affordable, uh, maybe colleges would shift to upfront pricing where if you're uh, earning less than $25,000 a year, here's the price you're going to pay. If you're earning more than $100,000 a year, here's the price you're going to pay. Maybe that would have more of an impact on reducing the college costs. And it certainly would put a lot of financial pressure on the colleges. Uh, whether they have the ability to adjust to that, that's, that's unclear, because a lot of the causes of increase in college costs are to some extent structural, uh, and you have to have a certain teacher-student uh, ratio we have the same faculty-student ratio today as we did 100 years ago because learning is fundamentally interactive. Uh, all this focus on MOOCs and other uh, online education where you can have one faculty teaching 100,000 students uh, doesn't take that into account. And if you look at the actual data on the MOOCs, they may start off with 100,000 students, but maybe a few hundred students will finish that course and uh, get credit in the course. So, uh, and part of the problem is that there isn't the same scalability in terms of the hand-holding aspect. The tutorial sessions, the faculty office hours, uh, the ability to ask questions of that faculty member in class, that isn't present in the online education. And that affects the quality of education. And when you have colleges I mean, increasing the, the number of students per faculty member in the classes, the quality of education goes down. If you have the classes offered less frequently, the ability to graduate on time goes down. All right, thank you so much. Let's give him another round of applause. For it's a lot to take in. A lot of important information, but we really appreciate you coming. Got up very early to fly here from uh, Vegas this morning. So now I'd like to ask the student panel to come up. I'm going to introduce you guys while you come up and get settled, and then we're going to do our survey with your clickers. So get ready. Um, joining us today is Diallo Bennett. He's a junior here at Portland State University. He is studying philosophy and communications and works on student retention for Diversity and Multicultural Student Services. Nina Wynn is with us, and she came up from Oregon State University. Thank you for coming up today. She's Chief of Staff of the Associated Students of Oregon State University. And Raylene McMillan is University Affairs Director for the Associated Students of Portland State University. And she is a first-generation college student who entered college at the age of 28. She is a junior majoring in political science with a minor in Spanish. So um, before we get started, let's go ahead and uh, get your clickers ready here. And the first question is a softball, just because we want to make sure it works. So please tell us if you push number one, if you are a current student, number two, if you are a prospective student, Number three, if you are a parent. Four, if you are faculty or staff. And five, if you are other. That would be me, other. Try to go through that again. Okay, too many, too many multiple guesses there. All right, one is a current student. Two is a prospective student. Three, if you're a parent. Four, faculty or staff. Five, is other. Is it wrong? Should I be reading the graphic? Okay. We had a little technical difficulty. It's all right. We could just do it informally, you know, go back, oh, I don't know, raising our hands if we have to. No, 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 no. <laughs> we could, though.
Okay, how many are current student? <laughs> okay, we got some, good, all right. Perspective students, anybody here today? They're still in school somewhere, right? Parents, any parents with us? Oh, yeah. Is it working? No, we're gonna keep going. Faculty or staff? Okay, plenty of you, good for you for coming. And other, that's me, I'm other. Oh, you're other too, great, nice to meet you. Um, so we're pretty widely represented here, definitely. So if, you, if it works, we'll go ahead to the other questions. Awesome, we're gonna skip that first one, we got it covered, unless you guys need that data. Do you want the data? Should we do it anyway? Okay, go ahead and do it, yes. Okay, so one, if you're a current student. Two, if you're a prospective student. Not working. Okay, never mind. Okay. Should we give it a go? Yeah. Okay. You guys can see it. I don't need to read it again to you. <laughs> Pick your number. Press your button. Let's see if it works. Can you press more than one? No. Don't try to mess this up. There's always one, isn't there? No, please don't. I don't know what will happen. Is, is it supposed to show up now? The answer? I do it? Oh my God. Yay. Boy, it does look awesome when it works, doesn't it? Yeah. We could make up our own questions. How many of you tried never to take an 8 a.m. class? No, let's go. We'll move on now since we have it working because this is interesting. Okay. All right, for all of you students out there, how much college debt are you looking at upon graduation? You can see one is none. I think you get an award if that's it. Two, less than 10,000. Three is 10,000 to 25,000. Four, 25 to 35. Five, 35 to 50. Six, more than 50. Take your time, do the math, add it up. This is sort of like the hanging Chad thing, isn't it? We're gonna have to hand count the ballots. There you go. Okay, so number three by a long shot. 10 to 25, that's plenty. All right, so how important is cost when uh, you were deciding or are deciding where to attend college? The number one consideration, important, but not the most important, one of several factors to consider along with quality, location, programs, or four, not a significant factor. Okay, I didn't know they didn't tell you how much it was gonna cost up front. There you go, okay, number three. One of several factors, makes sense. Okay, our next question, how appropriate are college costs and student debt in determining what career you pick? Hmm, 
Number one consideration, important but not the most important. A short-term consideration but not enough to determine my long-term career plans or not a significant factor. I was teaching, helping teach, not teaching, um, a class at Washington State University a couple of weeks ago where I graduated from, and it was the Advanced Broadcast News Group. And the whole time I'm thinking, oh, don't know what you guys are going to do. <laughs> oh. Go on the web. Number two, important but not the most important. Right, a job is definitely important, but not the, the end all. All right, next one. If you've taken or plan to take student loans for college, how informed are you about how much money you will need, when and how you will pay back the loans and other details? One, very informed. Two, somewhat informed. Three, no clue. Four, I'll worry about the details after I graduate. Four, my favorite, my parents are taking care of that for me. Five, I have no, uh, I have no loans and don't intend to take out a loan. I think you can answer for your parent because you know too. Okay, number two, somewhat informed, right. I think I kind of knew, but then after I graduated, I really knew. All right, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about pay it forward, which Mark was mentioning earlier and some of the audience members added to. The Oregon legislature passed a bill this year to consider a pay it forward approach. Instead of taking out loans, students would pay for college by agreeing to pay back their debt to the state over time out of their paychecks once they're working. Your thoughts on the idea? One, sign me up. Two, sounds like a good idea, but how will the state come up with the money to pay for it? Three, sounds good, but needs more study. Four, stick with the current system of public and private lending, but try to keep the interest rates low. And five, not sure, no opinion. And our final question, what's your favorite television station for news? No matter what button you push, it comes up KGW. Awesome. Okay, here we go. This sounds like a good idea, but needs more study. All right, very logical group out here today. Thank you, that's fun. And that might be fun for you guys to think about, and I bet you're kind of in the same boat, but I'd like to ask you guys maybe to just go down the row. We'll start with you, Raylene, about how are you paying for college? That's a great question. <laughs> Don't I know. Have, I, I have a significant amount of student loan debt. Can you all hear me? Very well. Lean in a little bit. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Is that, ooh, perfect. There we go. That's better. Um, uh, as, you, as you told everybody, I'm a non-traditional student. So I'm 30 years old, and I'm very fortunate to have a background in uh, mixology. So I'm able to teach at the Portland Bartending Academy to subsidize my income a little bit, or supplement my income, rather, I should say. Um, along with my significant amount of debt is kind of how I get through picking up bartending shifts here and there. So I'm fortunate to be able to have a trade that I can um, fall back on. Not a lot of my uh, student, fellow students are that fortunate. Do you know? But are you borrowing? Yes, absolutely. Okay. I do have a, I, I'm about, um, I know it's not polite to talk about money, but I'll go ahead and say Oh, that's about, what we're talking about today. We are talking about <laughs> money. Um, I'm about $27,000 in debt currently um, after graduate school. I really haven't fully done the math. See what that number is going to 
Um, Don't. I won't, not yet, not today. <laughs> okay, Diallo, what are you doing? Um, so I also have a significant amount of student loan debt. Um, luckily, I have a scholarship that pays for my tuition um, because I'm a first generation student um, and I think you should look into that, Raylene. Um, but I'm also around the same amount of uh, debt, around almost 30,000. And um, I also have a work study job, so that helps to subsidize some of the um, loans I'll have to pay in the future. Diallo, how much longer do you have to go? And you're already 27,000 in. I have about a year and a half. Year and a half to go, okay. All right, and Nina, how about you? I am a first generation American born and first generation to go to college in my family. and so. I'm a receiver of the Oregon Opportunity Grant, um, but even that's not enough to pay for my college costs, obviously. So I've taken out quite a few federal loans, and last year my mom ended up having to help me apply for this Parent PLUS loan. And this year, um, the university <sighs> took away $7,000 from my financial aid package about a month before school began, never notified me. Um, and I found out two weeks before school was about to start, went to go ask the financial aid office if there was any way, because they're federally required to split the funds that we see receive in federal loans among three of the terms that we are in college, asked to see if they could move the loans all into um, fall term so that I could have it easy this term. And, and then and figure out figure what to out do from other there. ways for the next two terms, but they didn't allow it. So. I ended up having to take a, a private loan through Wells Fargo of $10,000. Which um, is the worst, Mark said, yeah. And I'm expected to graduate um, in June, but I will probably still have to take summer term and then fall term will be used for my internship to wrap up and get my degree. And on top of that, working for student government, I've, for the past couple months, I've been paying about $400 a month to make up for the money that the university didn't cover. So Nita, did paycheck. they tell you why two weeks before school started that you weren't gonna get that money? No, I just, I didn't even bother because I was very irritated and I didn't want to yell at the front desk person. So I was like, can you move the loans or not? No, and then I walked out and figured it out on my own. Wow, it just seems like they're giving you a heads up on that, huh? Maybe they didn't know. So do you guys have questions for them? Because that would be fun to hear some of your thoughts. If not, of course, I can just talk, talk, talk. Okay, right over here, we have, wait for the mic so we can hear you for sure. Uh, Nina, I don't mean to pry, but uh, when you total it all up, we know what the other two uh, have accrued already. How much are you into? I'll probably graduate with about $30,000 in debt. And I think the most difficult part about that is that's just my student loan debt and private loan debt, but as the firstborn to an Asian um, family, there is an unspoken expectation that I will be assisting my parents in paying their own debts when I graduate and get a stable income. So I don't think people really think about those situations, like being a non-traditional student, like I'll have my $30,000 in debt, but my parents have a big chunk of debt that's probably twice as much as my own student loans, and I'm, I have this expectation to be able to help them pay it back when I graduate. And what is your major, Nina? I forgot already. I am a public health major in healthcare management and policy. Okay. Whew. Anybody else? Over here, great. I had a quick question. I thought it was interesting. I heard, uh, gee, I really didn't want to know, and it's not polite to talk about money. We do teach a financial literacy class over in the School of Business, and I wondered if you guys had seen information on that or considered it or thought about taking it in that I do think it's probably better to know what the situation is and what some of the tools are. Um, so I just wondered if we haven't gotten out the information that we have that class available as elective, no prereqs, I wonder if you've heard of it at all or considered taking it. Anybody? Um, I'll speak to that a little bit. Yeah, I have actually, and I, one of the objectives that ASPSU, the Associated Students of Portland State here that Diallo and I uh, both serve in, one of our objectives is to help inform students about um, uh, things like that, um, resources that are available on campus to help students increase their awareness um, about things that are available. Um, do respect to the tips that were offered to students earlier in the keynotes. There, well, and while there are definitely pockets of students that probably 
could use increased awareness of those tips. I think that the, the, the majority of students that I interact with, um, just as a student here and as a student government official, are very well aware of those um, and do engage those already. We, are, we do do things like um, buy used textbooks and sell them back. We, we, um, we do live with partners or housemates or things like that. Um, so I think the, the, the crisis, while awareness is definitely a problem uh, with certain pockets of students, like I said, I think that it, it does move beyond that. Um, yeah, and I, I also want to just second that. Um, I'm, I'm, I budget really well. I know exactly what my money is, my money situation is. And it's something that's unavoidable when you really desire going to higher education that you're probably going to go into debt, especially as a low-income student. Um, and honestly, um, after taking classes like the philosophy of education and looking at um, how education could be better, it, it makes me and it makes a lot of other people that I, I've spoke with often question if the cost is worth the benefit. And so it's... That's exactly what I wanted to know. Did you guys ever second guess it? Did you ever think, boy, I wonder what, is this really worth it to me? Well, on the account that, it's, that a degree doesn't guarantee a job? Right. No. So why are you doing it? I'm doing it because I'm still getting education and because I value education and because I'm passionate about that. What about you guys? Did you ever think, oof, I don't know? Some of my colleagues in the service industry giggle at me um, because I spent you know, seven years bartending alongside folks with bachelor's and master's degrees. Um, and when I decided to go back to school, um, a lot of my colleagues over in that industry, what are you, what are you doing? Um, my, my eventual goal is to teach high school. I want to teach high school civics here in Portland. Um, and yeah, sometimes I do wonder, you know, gosh, bartending a few nights a week um, for more money, right, um, than to, we all know the state, I think, hope we all know the state of Portland Public Schools right now and, and the struggle there. Um, but I think the benefits from within yeah. mm -hmm. um, are, are going to be so much far-reaching. Um, I, I think the, the short answer to that for me would be when, when I ask myself why am I doing this, I would you know, bartend in high-volume nightclubs for seven years and then, <laughs> and then make this decision. I, I think that for me it's an easy answer. Yeah. Nina, I assume part of it is uh, your family wants you to do this. Yes. Um, I've actually wanted to drop out every year. But somehow, I'm in my senior year, so um, kudos to that. But yeah. I am a learner. I value education as well. And I think it's just an important thing. But the other half of it is that I have an obligation to my family to get my degree and find a stable job with a stable income so that I can provide for them. Uh, I we also, have, oh, go I ahead, also want to say one more thing. Um, I also, the thing is that this topic of, of debt and debt slavery or wage slavery, um, it's, I also value freedom. And I know that I can't really give back without going through this process and getting the education. And I know that a lot of people fought for me to have freedom. And so that's why I'm currently doing this, so that I can continue that fight and carry that baton. And so it's just an, it is an easy answer to, to stay. <laughs> it's just that I question it. I OK, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, as, as you have been accumulating debt, have you taken into consideration or thought at all about how uh, the income-based repayment options may make your debt more manageable? And has that affected uh, your decisions about how much debt to accumulate? Sure, I'll jump in first. Um, yeah, I have, actually, um, the IBR options. Um, I think are, are wonderful to know about, and um, I have definitely considered them. I've had a few people, you know, point and say, I mean, I want to be a public school teacher, so while I definitely don't allow myself to count on that sort of um, assistance and loan forgiveness, you know, as a mm -hmm. school teacher later on, it is something that I can't help but keep in the yeah. back of my mind, right? Um, but definitely, yes, and, and thank you for bringing that up and giving us an opportunity to speak on that, because that's a wonderful resource that I think more students would be. Um, more students yeah. would benefit from knowing about you two. I think for me, I haven't really thought much about it. Like, the idea sounds good, but I 
I feel like there still needs to be a lot more study um, done into it, a lot of loose ends that need to be tied up before like it's a, something that I would consider. I do think that you know any option other than having to take out a massive amount of loans and worrying about paying it back later um, is a good option, but as with everything, there's pros and cons, and we need to really look at it to see if there's more cons to it than pros or more pros than cons. Yeah, and I think that the question, um, it, it relates to one of the questions, one of our clicker questions of um, what jobs, or does it, does it decide what we're going to do afterward, and definitely, um, I'm faced with the decision, do I leave this institution with confidence and pride to dream big and fight for world peace, or do I um, have to tailor my dreams based on my debt? And really that's what the answer is and I have to. And I know that I would love to get involved with teaching, that's probably what I'm going to end up doing, but um, it, definitely, it definitely does put barriers on my dreams, and I don't think that you should have to go through that in higher education. You should be able to to just explore infinitely, and so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of what higher education was partly supposed to be about, yeah, right? Yeah, Exploration, basically. dreaming big. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? Oh yeah, over here, great. Nina, you said that you had some private debt. Do the other panelists have private debt as well, or do you have just federal debt? I don't have any private debt. Other than my credit card, no. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Do you have advice for us on what you wish we would have told you, like in middle school or high school or college before? I mean, we're all like all ears. Like, what could we have done, or what can we do, for your, the younger people to let them know and to warn them? I have a few, I know that more will come to me, um, but teaching us the value of exploring knowledge and not necessarily even needing a college degree, just that joy of learning I think is important because I think that's, at a, at a younger age, that's what helps people become entrepreneurs, that's what helps people start businesses and create new ideas. Instead, education is uh, a factory model that puts people into a workplace, it puts people into um, a, a system versus allowing people to create systems. And so I wish, I wish that I would have had that joy of learning early on and learned critical thinking and rationality and ethics and morality early on. That's an interesting question for me personally because like I said, I aim to teach high school and um, the primary reason I want to teach high school is I want to do my small part to address the civic engagement mm -hmm. crisis that we have in this country. Yeah. Um, and so I would, at risk of getting a little bit too broad with it, um, I would say a higher level of encouragement of that, of that sort of engagement, because I think that's where we start, right? Okay. Um, programs like, um, I don't know, there, there's a lot of good ideas, I think, waiting to be mined out there. And the more that we can encourage our young folks to address the problem from a, an earlier age, while also not discouraging them from accruing debt and, and seeking an education, I think that that's a really tough balance that yeah. we'll have to find um, as we move forward. So I don't know. I would love to, I know that I won't have this opportunity. I would love to, th that's an amazing question. I wish I could think on that for an hour and then get back to you. <laughs> but. Did you have anything you want to add, Nina? Mm, I went to Benson Polytechnic High School here in Portland, and so it's a technical vocational magnet high school, and I got to explore like the medical field in different ways. Um, I got my CNA when I graduated high school, which was something that not very many high school students did. And I think, you know, Portland Public School, like in that aspect, um, does a pretty good job in like at least at Benson when I was there. Um, allowing students to explore different technical career paths. But um, I think, if anything, for seniors or something in high school, or having them learn about all the finances, what's, you know, what's a bad interest rate to take um, on loans, what's a good interest rate, why it's 
what's the difference between subsidized loans, unsubsidized loans, like all those financial things that will help them um, fare out better when they get to college. Because I know my first year at Oregon State, um, I had to do a lot of prying and digging and looking for information on my own to make sure that my finances were in place. It sounds like they need the finance class long before college. <laughs> yes. So I'm going to give a little bit of a commercial because um, I run a nonprofit called Financial Beginnings, which actually addresses personal finance in K through 12. Um, it is a free program, so any of you that are parents or no teachers, um, we actually provide all of the materials to the educators, bring in speakers to talk about credit and banking and all of these issues that we wish we had known before we went out onto our own. Um, and also to give you guys um, kind of a little bit of history is personal finance was required in Oregon until 97 and we took it away as a course. Why? We're, Why? Um, they had to decrease the social science content that was offered to increase the, the math and the science and reading. And so, um, but it is still required that they learn about personal finance. And last year they did implement to where um, financial literacy is a standalone <laughs> content standard in social science. So if your students are attending school in Oregon, you should be asking them where are they learning about personal finance because it is required. Well, geez, I think what they learn is that the, the best tip I'm going to go home and tell my kids today is for every dollar you borrow, you're going to pay back two, right? And that's probably with a good interest rate. Oh, yeah. I mean, think about, you know, you buy that first laptop because I'm going off to school. I need that laptop. And you make that minimum payment because, well, they're just asking me for the minimum payment. And then it ends up that it takes you 20 years to pay for that laptop and you're paying $3,000 for it. Who's got a 19-year-old, 20-year-old laptop? Right. So it is. It's, and more students will drop out of school due to financial strain yeah. than academic failure. So it really is important for us to come together and really make sure that we are educating our youth about money so that they can go and be successful. Yeah, it seems like a no-brainer. Do you guys know kids or students that have dropped out, yeah. run out of money, and so they're just done? Yeah. I would say anecdotally that that is absolutely accurate, what she just shared with us. Um, I hear of far more students dropping out because they just can't afford it anymore rather than than the academic strain, yeah. And I think that with us gathered here today um, in the mission of developing an action plan to actually reduce those costs, um, I hope that the energy doesn't get lost and that we actually find ways to reduce the cost because by the time my little sister and brother get to high, call, higher education, they're gonna be priced out. And um, knowing that PSU, has risen 32% in the past five years, there's absolutely no way that they'd be able to go to higher education, so. Hmm. Well, we were talking though that state funding is down to 5%, right, at some of the universities and 12% at some of the others, so it's no question why the tuition has gone up. Any more questions? Hey everybody, um, my name is Cameron. I already know Raylene and Diallo here. Um, so I guess my question, and uh, I'm sort of gonna bring up some stuff that y'all mentioned earlier. Um, it sounded sort of Diallo like you were talking about um, education as a, as a social and public good rather than as a commodity. Um, and so I guess with the state of Oregon spending $30,000 on every inmate and $10,000 on every student, um, and with, I don't know if anyone saw the recent numbers about how it would take only $12.4 billion of new money to, uh, if you factor in um, existing spending on Pell Grants as well as um, tax breaks for college savings accounts amongst other things, that uh, it would only take $12.4 billion to make public higher education free yeah. nationally, um, community colleges included. Um, so how would you like to see both state and federal spending reprioritized um, con considering that education is a social good? Um, thank you for asking that question. And 
Honestly, I feel a higher education and education in general should be free and compulsory, the idea that it was created out of. Um, I also think that we need to be on the right side of history and know that it's better for our future, it's better for our name now, it's better for it just in general for our society that we educate each other, that we make sure that people are able to come up with new and creative ideas and not kept ignorant. Touche. <laughs> <laughs> um, as far as prioritization of, of funds go, there's a, a quote that sticks with me often from one of our own actually, uh, part, of, part of my job is union liaison from student government to the faculty and staff unions here on campus. It's my favorite part of my job. Um, so I get to hang out with union leadership quite a bit. And uh, Michael Chamberlain, who serves on the executive council for AAUP, uh, the American Association for University Professors, our, our chapter here. Um, he said, and I'm paraphrasing him, he's, he says it a lot better than I do, but um, he said something over the summer that stuck with me. He said, think of the last time that there was a time our federal government wanted to go to war, and then they sat back and said, well, there's just no money to do that. Um, that really resonated with me. I, I really, um, gosh, you know, how do we fix that? Like, how do we attack that? I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't know, but I guess I just, I thought I would share Let's that Let's put thought. Congress on it. <laughs> yeah, sorry. That's actually one of my favorite quotes too. You know, mm -hmm. I remember you mentioning that to me, um, and I'm glad that that's getting shared <laughs> because we do question education all the time. We mm -hmm. question how much is it going to cost for our basic needs, how much is it going to cost for education, but we never question war, mm -hmm. and that's something that we should seriously be questioning. Budgets so. reflect priorities. Yeah. I think that's inarguable. Yeah. I just feel like so much money is being placed elsewhere and education seems to be like almost the last priority. Mm -hmm. And we have elementary and middle school and even in high school where, you know, places where growth is being fostered by teachers um, all over the state and we glorify college and say, you know, these are all the opportunities that you have if you can make your way up the totem pole and get to higher education and all of that. But then no one tells them the other end of it, and it's that they're gonna be in a lot of debt when they graduate. So it's like, if money is reprioritized and education gets the funding that it should be, then you know we can continue to foster the growth in the primary educational phase, and then have students be able to get up to post-secondary education or secondary education, and just not have to worry too much about being in debt and getting the experience that they're being talked up about constantly. Well, I thought one of the interesting things Mark said that is a good argument <clears throat> is that it's not just the student who benefits. It's, I mean, I'm talking about money. I mean, the federal government, the state government, everyone benefits when someone has higher education because yeah. you make more, so you pay more, yeah. right? So they, I, you would think that it would be a good investment on all fronts. Hmm. Questions? Any, anybody else? Over here. Yeah, I wanted to ask uh, the three of them as they uh, go about their days uh, on, on campus and you know, think about uh, how, how much they owe and how this is building, uh, how, how much this, this looms over them and uh, affects uh, the, the way they're living. I try to not let it loom over me day to day. <laughs> I try my best. Um, you know, I, what I do is just kind of channel it and allow it to motivate me. Um, the work that we do here in student government, uh, here on campus and along with the statewide student movement with the Oregon Student Association, um, many of us, most of us, I would say, are motivated by that. So um, it looms negatively sometimes, absolutely, but I think that there are many of us who, who utilize it um, and kind of morph it into that productive, positive energy to, to help make changes for not only ourselves, but, you know, Diallo's little sister that was just born a few days ago, right? <laughs> Absolutely. You guys have any other thoughts on that? I, I do. Go um, for it. So, yeah, I um, still have to, you know, take out loans to cover my books, fees, um, transportation, my apartment, 
uh, my clothes, and I often have to actually decide between do I wash clothes or do I get lunch one day? And so it's something that is always on my mind, um, money, and it's one of my um, most scary and biggest stresses because even over an unemployed mom, a grandma who's facing housing foreclosure and who currently have to depend on government assistance to survive, and really that's what I'd be doing. I'm, I'm also a debt slave in that situation. Um, something that helps me get over it is to, um, ho luckily I, I can, I'm a really good philosophy student and I can view this as a fiat currency and not let a monopoly game get in the way of real problems. And so that's one thing that I, I often have to re reframe my viewpoint on what is this thing. This is, this, is a, this is a piece of paper. This is a fiat currency. And I know that there's, there's real issues out here. There's real things that we, we can be focused on. Like how are we making sure that everybody gets education, you know? Whether or not it's a dollar amount, you know, I don't. Really, that's why I don't care about the debt sometimes, because, or that's why I don't care about continuing to go to higher education, and it's not a factor because I know that it's just something that is not as valuable as my human worth. So, financial situations are things that come across my mind all day, um, even in simple decisions as. You know, do I really want to buy this breakfast bagel? Because working 20 hours a week and taking 15 credits and being president of multiple student organizations on campus, my days start at 5 a.m. and they end at 8 p.m. And that's not including dinner time and studying time and all of the, all of the above. So sometimes I'm not home all day and I can't go home and make a meal because I'm in between different activities. And so sometimes I have to starve myself because I'm, because especially this year, I'm paying my own tuition at the moment because my private loan hasn't fully been processed yet. And so I have to decide like, you know, am I gonna eat today or am I gonna save my money to pay for my tuition? And there have been times where like, I pushed off buying my textbooks this year until probably last week yeah. because I was waiting to get money. Fortunately, I got an email a couple weeks ago from the bookstore saying I was given a $250 scholarship for books for the rest of the year, which is like half a textbook, but money is money. <laughs> okay, let's talk about that. <laughs> but money is money, and it's on my mind all day, every day, in every decision that I make, from buying a cup of coffee to getting breakfast in the morning so I can be present in all my classes. For the that class. makes me sad. You shouldn't have to worry about that till you're older like me. Then you do worry about those things, but I think that's sad that that hangs over your head every day at school. Especially yeah. when you're supposed to be in higher education and you're supposed to be focused on that. I mean, it really takes away that joy of education. Mm -hmm. It takes away that feeling of uh, coming here and, yeah, go ahead, I'm talking too much. <laughs> no, it's true though, it's true, it definitely is. Any other thoughts, questions? Yeah, Mark. How much tolerance do you have for uh, increases in costs or increases in the debt? If, if college costs were to go up by $500, $1,000, $5,000, at what point would it force you out of college? I can only speak to my, my own personal my personal point of view on that is I would find a way, because I mentioned before I'm, I'm fortunate to be able to um, teach mixology um, and actually engage in mixology. Is the thing. We're just gonna make that a thing, that's a thing. Um, I'm able to go, I can say, well, you know what, maybe I'll only take um, eight to 12 credits this term and pick up an extra shift at work each week, right? Um, so these incremental things like $500 a term, for me personally, I come from a place of uh, being able to, to stomach that in small increments. The fact is, is that there are countless students that are not able right. to stomach those increments. Um, they, you know, $500 a term, I mean, that's their grocery budget for the term, yeah. right? Um, so those small increases do price a lot of students out. But what you're saying is that you would have to go longer. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yes. Thank you for pointing that out, Tracy. That's absolutely, yeah. that's accurate. Um, you know, only taking eight to 12 credits a term, I mean, that, that's gonna keep yeah. me here longer and longer and 
Yeah. That interest is going to... Uh, my answer to that question is uh, I have zero tolerance for it because I have, I'm, I'm basing my center off of the fact that education should be free. Um, but it's not going to price me out because I can take out loans for it and I'm going to continue to to fight for getting an education every day. And so it's not going to stop me from trying to attend if I can still take a loan out for it because I've already kind of... Um, I've, I've already vibed with the fact that I'll be paying these loans back for a while, so it's not a worry as much. For me, I've gone this far, so I don't think any more increases would push me out, but um, it would keep me in college a little longer because this is one of the reasons why I have to go into a fifth year partially because I've decreased my credits so I can work more and pay for stuff. And, so You're not alone. Boy, yeah, you are not alone in that. Y'all yes. remember when your school debt got paid off? I remember that day like yesterday. You just felt so free and happy and like you had all this money all of a sudden, right? Mm -hmm. It was so great. I found somewhere else to spend it pretty quickly, though. Um, anything else, you guys, before we take a break? Well, thank you guys so much, really. Thank you. I really appreciate you being so honest and sharing your stories. It's really awesome. It is. Um, let's take about a 15-minute break, and then we'll come back for our next keynote speaker, which should be fantastic. Uh, Mr. Rohit Chopra is the Assistant Director of Consumer Financial Protection Bureau from the federal government. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started then. Um, our next guest, we are very, very lucky to have him here between government shutdowns. <laughs> I just can't stop myself. Mr. Rohit Chopra is the Assistant Director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and he really is the one who leads the agency's work on behalf of students and young Americans, which is, of course, why we're here today. He was designated by the Secretary of the Treasury as the CFPB's student loan ombudsman, and that was a new position <clears throat> that was created by the Dodd-Frank Act. He holds a BA from Harvard College and an MBA from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. He is um, very smart and very focused on what we need to do as a state and as a nation to make college affordable again. So please welcome him. So, Thanks for having me today, and before I start, I just want, since many of you are students, I want to give a little bit of background on where have we come as a country in the past five or six years. So literally five months, five years and one month ago was September 2008, and this was when really we saw the cracks in our financial system just completely break apart. So this is when we saw uh, the collapse of Lehman Brothers, one of the biggest bankruptcies in history, problems with AIG, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. Some of you might have been in high school du during this, but people forget that often high school students and, and college students, they felt this too. They felt it because they saw their parents having issues, they saw their neighbors facing foreclosure, and they really saw kind of the economy collapsing around them just as they're approaching adulthood. And so what we saw in 2008 was often the consequence of a fundamental change over really thousands of years of human history about how banking and lending works. So I know there was some, I know people maybe are talking bad about history majors, but I love history majors because we learn a lot from this. And so the, our earliest knowledge of banking rules and lending rules really dates back to Babylon. So the, the Code of Hammurabi, which many of you probably know from eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, was actually the first place that there was a rule about lending. And it said you couldn't charge more than a certain interest rate. It was, it was a, our first usury cap. 
And so lending was kind of basic for thousands of years, but in the Western world, just about 20 years ago, we really changed the way lending worked. So if I was a, a, a financial institution and offering you a loan, I would do so because I think you're going to pay me back, and you're going to pay me back with some interest. But really what changed 20 years ago is a new way of lending where I could lend you money, know that you might not pay me back, and I will sell that loan, and I will chop it up, and I'll turn it into bonds, and I'll sell it to pension funds who will resell it, who will then you know, bet on it if it will make money or lose money. And so the fundamental transaction between lender and borrower changed, where a lender could make money even if the borrower couldn't pay back. And we started to see how that really transformed uh, the mortgage market, the housing market, and we saw it completely collapse. So what I want to offer today is some thoughts and a perspective as someone who oversees and regulates financial institutions and think a little bit about what did we see over the past 10 years with the uh, downfall of our housing market and how we might think about some of these things in tandem as we look about how it might be connected to student loans. So very briefly, for those of you who are not familiar, and I assume most of you are not, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is established as part of the Dodd-Frank reforms. So in 2010, Dodd-Frank is passed, and it is a it seeks to address a lot of the issues that caused the financial crisis. But one of the key reforms was the creation of an agency who was singularly accountable to make sure that consumer financial product markets are fair and transparent. Many of the most difficult practices we saw in the mortgage market where uh, shoddy subprime lending, illegal foreclosures, these are high issues that are very top of mind in making sure that consumers, when they're not protected, it can often mean a ripple effect on the entire economy. So we conduct research on consumer markets, we write rules, we supervise banks, and for the first time, the federal government actually supervises non-banks that are very, were very important in, the, in causing the financial crisis, the so-called shadow financial system. These were mortgage lenders, private student lenders, credit bureaus, check cashers, payday lenders. You're familiar with all of them. And now there is a more even amount of oversight. And so just like before the CFPB, there was a lot of non-banks originating subprime mortgages to people who couldn't afford it. We also saw in the 2000s a robust industry of student lenders who were uh, offering loans to students at sometimes high rates and directly marketing it to them without working through the school. And in many cases, that caused people to borrow a lot in private loans without taking advantage of some of their federal loan options. And many of them find that they are out of luck and out of options on those loans. And it's just like in the mortgage market, those loans were grouped and packaged and sliced and diced and turned into bonds such that even if the lender didn't really know if you could pay it back, they were still able to make a profit. Now, some of this has changed, and we're taking steps to make sure that these same issues don't repeat itself, but there's a lot of work to be done. So, the financial crisis, I think, is not, we all hear about the foreclosures, the unemployment, but we don't really talk enough about how the financial crisis really has devastated, in many states, public higher education. And there's a few things that really, it has a direct impact on student debt. So of course, individual households are poorer. So they might have depleted their savings because they faced unemployment. The value of their homes collapsed. Uh, they may have had to, they, as Mark mentioned, the stock market took a dive. And so their retirement savings for people who did not have pensions 
really went down. And so this really changed not only the individual household, but also the state. So many states, almost every single one, faced a huge decline in tax revenues. And so that meant, in many ways, having to make some very difficult cuts, and often public higher education finds itself first on the chopping block. Now, that meant that if public higher education had less support and families had less money, they were not able to use the traditional sources to finance education. So they didn't have savings, they didn't have home equity, so that means that they couldn't take out home equity loans. Their family, you know, many people forget that often people rely on extended family for, you know, uh, informal loans or for help when sending a, a someone to college. And so many of those traditional sources disappeared. So all of that led to more and more debt. And so the CFPB, we and the Federal Reserve compute where things are in the, t in the student loan market, and we're now at about $1.2 trillion, with the vast majority of that being federal loans. Now, $1.2 trillion, to give it a sense of scale, it is more debt than outstanding credit cards, more debt than outstanding auto loans by, by quite a bit now. It is, of course, very much smaller than mortgages, which is, you know, about 10 times the size, but it is by far the largest source of unsecured debt in America. Now, I always like to remind people of this. Student debt estimates of 1.2 trillion, this is a low estimate because this is just student loans. It does not account for home equity loans that people take on, credit card debt people use for educational expenses, informal loans, borrowings from their retirement savings. So the amount of debt that is being used has actually grown quite significantly. Now, so what could be the causes of this? Well, some people try and say that, well, you know, it's just because lots more people should go to college and, and, and they're going to college, and so we should be happy that there's so much debt. It's an interesting perspective, but there is really some other drivers going on other than unemployment. I mentioned already cuts to public higher education, which is where the vast majority of students attend. But the, having a, it's not advancing. Could you advance the slide? But actually individual borrowers are taking out a lot more debt. So it's not just enrollment increases. It is, and, and th this chart here just shows um, what's the average debt per borrower by, by type of school. So for those of you who can't read it, the top line is the for-profit college sector, which by far uh, whose graduates leave with the most debt. And then below that is private nonprofit schools, and then below that is public four years. And if you look, if you look at the bottom two, um, since 2008, which is where we really st start seeing cracks in the broader economy, that's where debt really starts to go up. Now, one of the things that we always talk about, you know, I, th I think the, the panel before, this was a, a really good reminder that for many people, higher education, they didn't say this, but it, it in some ways feels priceless. It feels a, a part about being an American or being human, about wanting to better yourselves and achieve your dream. And I think we, should, we can't forget that aspect of it. But when we look at it from a banking or lending context, we've got to also think about the economics of it. So everyone talks about, and I'm sure you've heard this in the media before, how important it is to go to college the college wage premium, that you're going to earn zillions of dollars more over the course of your lifetime because you have a college degree. So generally speaking, this is true. Unemployment rates for people who have college degrees are much less than those who do not have college degrees. And of course, you will earn more 
than someone without a college degree, and it will be substantial over the course of your life. But one of the problems is that the growing college wage premium, that is the difference between those who went to college and those who did not go to college, the reason it is growing is not because new college graduates have growing wages. It is because non-college graduates' wages are falling fast. So I apologize, this is, might, might be a little bit difficult chart, but what I, I want to show in the circle there is that if you look at all college graduates, even before the financial crisis, on a real basis, that means inflation adjusted, from 2000 to 2011, college graduates' wages fell by over 5%. So if you think about it from a lending perspective, this means that people are earning less on an inflation-adjusted basis, but borrowing more. We've seen this story before. So student loan borrowers have what we call higher DTIs, or higher debt-to-income ratios. That is the monthly payment that they are required to pay relative to their income keeps going up. And we're, and we're really seeing this in some of the delinquency trends. So I get a little bothered when people talk about, well, why aren't you know, students are being irresponsible. And, you know, the, I, I don't really see the data to support that they're being irresponsible. But really, for those people who entered college before the collapse of the financial system, they were thinking, and very logically so, that when they graduated, that they would be able to get a job and that they would be able to comfortably pay off those debts. But for so many people, who graduated in 2009, 2010, not only did it take them longer to find a job, but for many people, they had to work in another job that wasn't necessarily matched to what their skill was, and so they weren't earning that much. So even unemployment rates might have been very understated. Now, I'm gonna say something that might bother some of you, but for many people, it, it, it's rational. Th this concept of student loan delinquency is quite rational, that it's gone up because if you think about a person who's struggling, they need to prioritize what they're going to pay. Now, for a borrower, they might not, they probably rarely just have a student loan. They probably also, and in, in most of America, do require a car to get to work. And you notice that auto loan, uh, for, throughout even the crisis, auto loan delinquencies were actually quite low because people, when choosing between paying their mortgage or paying their auto loan, this is a depressing comment, but I've heard it a number of times, they would think to themselves, I need my car to get to work, and at least I can live in my car. And so this is the concept of payment hierarchy, that we naturally think and prioritize how we're going to pay. And so it may make very much sense that people who are struggling and not making enough money are actually paying their rent or their car loan before their student loan. And if you look at the credit card delinquencies, for many people, we find that credit cards is not an addiction to coffee. It is a way that they actually are staying afloat from month to month. So paying that credit card on time can often mean the difference of being able to stay afloat and make it to another day. So we've got to really understand the complexities between what, what, that the assumption that people are being irresponsible um, is one that is not really well grounded in data. Now, that being said, delinquency may actually be uh, partially an issue that many people are not able to easily enroll in some of the income-based plans on their federal loans or their pri for, in the case of private loans, they may not even be able to negotiate an affordable payment plan. I, 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 I think anecdotally we hear from thousands of consumers and, and we see their complaints, we read their stories. The overwhelming theme is that borrowers want to pay 
but they just need to find a payment plan that works for them, and too often that can be complicated. We already went through this problem in the mortgage market where people f were unemployed, they wanted to stay in their home, they weren't trying to get out of their mortgage, but they just needed a temporary fix so that they could actually get back on their feet. So I want to talk a little bit about the link to the housing market because this the housing market is a very important component of the overall economy. And so when we've looked at the data about what's happening in the housing market, we see that first time home buyers as a percentage of all home buyers is actually quite low by historical patterns. And you would think quite the opposite because interest rates were low. There were some fundamentals that made people think people are going to jump into the housing market, particularly young people. But what we find is that young people aren't forming households. And when I say forming households, I mean living on their own. And so we see that three quarters of the overall shortfall in new housing starts are actually due to reductions amongst people 18 to 34. And in 2011, two million more Americans in that 18 to 34 group lived with their parents compared to 2007. Now, I once was reading about the, uh, there was a magazine article and a few blogs when some of this data came out saying, you know, this is just, you know, millennials, they just want to nest. They want to live near their parents. They want to be closer to their mom and dad. And I thought to myself, or they're just doing what's very rational and trying to save money sometimes and get back on their feet. And when we try and simplify something, and sometimes it's very patronizing and talking about, well, people just, all they need is Facebook, Twitter, and mom's laundry or something ridiculous like that. We need to like put that aside and really look at the data. And the data shows that so many people are having trouble getting jobs that will allow them to comfortably pay off their loans comfortably meet their expenses and actually progress in life. And one of the things I want you all to think about is that when you think about issues in student loan debt, don't divorce it from the broader issues our society faces with wages. Because in some ways, if there was wage growth for young people entering the, the job market, a lot of the student debt issues really wouldn't be as bad even if debt was growing. So what we think is that there's a possibility that people with this high debt relative to their income not only will not be able to rent their own apartment and furnish it, but also it may impair their ability to qualify for a mortgage. So the National Association of Realtors does an economic study and they survey, uh, they survey American, Americans about who, who want to buy a home. And for the first year we worked with them to add in their survey a, a list of reasons why people uh, aren't able to jump into the housing market. So some of them is I haven't, I haven't been able to save enough for a down payment. I'm, I'm worried about what the housing market will look like. And this year they included, I, I have a lot of student debt. And almost half of respondents cited that as a huge reason for not being able to get into the housing market. That was, a, that was the top huge reason. And so it somewhat is rational that if you can't save for a down payment, if you have all this debt on you, you won't be able, a mortgage lender may be less willing to offer you a mortgage. At the same time, the broader policies of, that, of low interest rates has led, in, in some people's view, housing prices to really go up recently. And ironically, it's becoming, housing might be coming farther and farther out of reach for those with student loan debt. And so we've also thought about what are the other potential domino effects on the rest of the economy. And I don't really like when people talk about, use the term bubble and words like that, because in many ways, it, it may be a bubble that really can't pop um, because of the way it's structured. 
But what, instead of leading it to a calamity for, uh, that would cause financial institutions to be insolvent, so in the mortgage market, there was actually there was a real worry, which we saw happen, that the mortgage market threatened the, the ability for a bank to stay in business, and many banks failed, and there were some large ones. But with student debt, it's so different because the credit risk, the fact that the uh, uh, borrower might not pay it back, the banks aren't really holding that risk. It's largely concentrated with the federal government. Now, when you, when you lose your home uh, and the bank has to sell it in a foreclosure, they take quite a big loss on that loan. In student debt, it's quite different. When the federal government, uh, when you default on a federal loan, the federal government has extraordinary powers to collect that money from you. They can offset your, uh, take your tax refund. They can take any federal benefit from you. They can garnish your wages without going to court. And there's a very long period of time. You're young often when you're a student loan borrower. And they can collect from you for a very, very long time, even your social security benefits. So because of those extraordinary collection powers, even when people default and they face large fees for collection activity, the federal government doesn't take an enormous loss compared to, say, a credit card company when you don't pay loses quite a bit of money. So that structure means that there won't be the type of immediate crisis uh, or time period when there's going to be a, a large threatening effect to the global economy. But instead, I think there could really be a drag on a number of things outside of housing. So if we think about, and Mark mentioned some of this, the issue of retirement security, it means that people can't necessarily devote money to 401ks and other things like that. So they're going to be behind when it comes to saving for retirement. There's evidence to show that young people with a lot of debt are going to be much less likely to start a small business or become an entrepreneur. There is maybe a much more acute impact on rural areas. And this is even true in Oregon, where in rural areas, the availability of rental housing is actually quite limited. And so if you're not able to rent, uh, that means in order to move to that community shortly after graduation, you do need to become a home purchaser. And if you're not able to access housing, that could really impact uh, what the, the fabric of rural life and maybe exacerbate the challenges that rural areas have in attracting young workers. And you know, also we, we hear all the time from different constituencies worried about this. Veterinarians uh, graduate the vast, over not, about 90% of them graduate with some debt, and the average debt that debtor, veterinarian, uh, veterinary student doctors have is about $150,000. Now, that's not possible to, for many of them to m pay off that debt if they're doing um, dairy medicine or livestock management. And these are professions that are very critical to rural areas, but instead they, it's, it's not in the cards for them. Health professionals is another area where, where we see some maybe distinct impacts of student debt. So medical students, uh, often with high levels of debt, will see that caring for the elderly or children, the core primary care for, uh, professions, may be much less attractive to pursue. Because if they're not able to make the kind of salaries they need to service that debt, that's only exacerbating what could be a very bad primary care shortage because of the demographics of this country over the next 20 years. And then, of course, teaching. So this is an area where many people, if we're looking to attract qualified teachers, uh, many teachers now are required to have master's degrees and often take on significant amounts of debt. And while there are a number of forgiveness programs and other options, they, it, they may feel dissuaded from staying in the profession because they may have to make trade-offs when it comes to progressing economically themselves. So there really have uh, been a number of potential solutions that people have raised. And one of the things I want to just share with everybody is that 
I think we heard from that no individual, including the pay it forward proposal, there's nothing that's a silver bullet, right? And we need to actually think about what problem it is we're trying to solve. And I think we should make sure that there's a number of options to pursue rather than just one. And so where the CFPB is really focused on, because of where we saw the breakdowns in the mortgage market and, and how it hurt homeowners so bad, is we are really thinking hard about how to help the tens of millions of people who already have the $1.2 trillion of debt. Many of them wonder why they can't refinance their debt to take advantage of today's historically low interest rates. The low interest rates that's cre uh, partially created by the Federal Reserve Bank's policy to keep interest rates low. Public, uh, public entities, you know, maybe even this university, maybe other universities, state legislatures, others have been able to refinance their bonds to low rates, and that's a huge windfall for them. Corporations have refinanced all of their corporate debt in some cases to take advantage of low rates. Homeowners have been able to refinance their mortgages, but the options to take it, get, get a lower rate on your student loan are few and far between. In many cases, people with private loans, the loan is priced with the risk that they may not graduate or get a job. And after you graduate and get a job, you wonder, why am I paying this 12% rate? That does not reflect my risk. And so people are wondering how we can get that market going. The other uh, question is really about restructuring of a lot of the private loans. And while private loans are a small part of the overall pie, uh, as a, for people who graduate around the financial crisis, over 80% of borrowers with high debt, which I, you know, I kind of consider 40,000 or more, 81% use private loans. So figuring out ways that they can restructure that debt such that they are not soaking up a huge portion of their income and leading them to really not be able to stay afloat, that's something we have to really think through. You know, some people have proposed the concept of bankruptcy reform, but in some ways, having a young person go through a bankruptcy process can also be pretty harmful to them from a credit perspective. They might have a tough time getting any type of loan for the next several years. So figuring out ways that we can create more restructuring activity to help people stay afloat is a priority. And then many have proposed the concept of making income-based plans much more broadly available even for existing borrowers. So existing borrowers, uh, there's even some private companies that are looking to uh, kind of trade their debt in exchange for a percentage of their income over, over time, and, and there's a lot of uh, challenges with that model as well. So we also have to think they're, they're in many ways two separate problems, but they have a lot of overlap. So existing borrowers, we need to do more. Future students, you know, obviously the core college cost issue, and I, I hesitate to use the word cost and price because they're really two different things in higher education. Cost is really what it co costs both the public and the family to really, uh, to, to really deliver some education, and the price is really what the student sees. And in some ways, we've got to fix both the cost and the price. And that will be a huge part of helping to stabilize things. But it is really not an easy thing to figure out. There is, of course, plans like Pay It Forward. And one of the really cool parts of Pay It Forward is that it removes this, what I like to think of as this albatross effect of people feeling that they have this huge burden and therefore don't feel that they can actually pursue the occupation that might be best for them, don't feel like they can jump into the housing market, start a small business, and that, that changes how they might think about it. And there are, as others have mentioned, there are some very similar features to income-based plans. And income-based plans are good in the sense that they help you manage your cash flow that your, your payments won't eat up a huge portion of your income, and that's very similar to Pay It Forward, but Pay It Forward has one advantage of being able to remove that sort of albatross effect. The thing that I wanna really 
have you, and I think what's good is that many people developing these proposals are really looking to get a lot of public input on how to figure it out. Of course, the issue of contract enforcement is going to be one that needs to be solved because we want to make sure that people who benefit from it actually are paying um, forward rather than running away from it. And so a lot of those details have to be thought through. And my, my one caution I would share is that try to look at other big problems that we face because in some ways they might be a little bit similar. So just take, for example, uh, public transportation, right? So we've been fit trying to figure out every individual state, city, how do, we, how do we make this work? Just like higher education, we know that good transportation systems are good for all of us. They actually make the economy more competitive. They help people reach jobs. There's all sorts of good things about good airports, roads, trains, et cetera. But really, we've always struggled about how to figure out how to finance public transportation. And I like to think of it as, do we have the public pay for it, meaning our states and cities, or do we have users pay for it? So public transportation uses both, right? The public generally pays some upfront costs, and then often it's kept going to a to certain extent with fares or, or other sorts of fees. And so how are, how do, when you're thinking about developing your own pay-it-forward proposal, how is the uh, distribution between the public and the users? Because in some ways, if people who are attending school are mostly the ones shouldering the burden for the next generation of students, it means it's largely the users rather than accurately factoring in the broader public who benefits from it. So I know many of you are thinking about what's the right role between what the state puts in in terms of how it benefits the broader public versus the individual users who might privately benefit. And I, I, where I want to also push all of you to think about is sometimes simpler is better. And I think it's generally true in the case of finance. So I don't know if others of you there's a lot of good work that's being done on, you know, educating people to learn the complexities of student loans and, and all these financial products. But I often like to think about, um, I have one of those TVs that I have a TV and I have a um, receiver because I hook speakers up to it and I have a, a cable set-top box. And actually it requires three different remote controls. And when I have to change it, you actually have to use a pattern in order of the remote controls, right? So you actually have to first change the input from HDMI 1 to cable, and then the volume is different, and then changing the channel on the TV remote screws it up, but if you do it on the cable one. So it is true, I, and I have tried to teach this um, to my parents many times. <laughs> and what, what, what I notice is that even when you try and teach people, uh, they'll often try and they'll often figure, out, figure it out when they really need to do it. But when you teach them at a time when they don't necessarily need to know how to use it, it may not be as effective. And sometimes you just need to simplify the process so it's not so hard to explain. And we've unfortunately turned into a culture where we go online, we blindly check off, I agree to the terms and conditions, and I just want to move on. But really, are, are we really expected to print out the 75 pages of word vomit and, and use a magnifying glass to figure out what it means? Sometimes. We just need to simplify it. And I also feel that for first generation families, we don't have as much data to support this, but generally there's a hypothesis that a more complex system for dealing with loans and financial aid makes people sometimes think, I don't really know what this is about and maybe this isn't for me. And that's sad because higher education is for them. It's for everybody who really you know, wants to work hard and play by the rules. 
So as you think about the, in your working groups about how you might solve the various different pieces of this student debt puzzle, think about the role between the public and the user or the individual. Think about existing borrowers versus future students. And remember that there's no solution where one size fits all. So as I hope that you can think more about how student debt is just no longer the exception in life today and it's increasingly becoming the norm. And the impacts are not just on higher education, but they really could be much broader. And for, for immediate advice, and Mark gave a lot of, of tips, but sometimes, you know, it's, it's not just about, uh, it, it, figuring out how to spend wisely is great, but really, sometimes we just gotta not look back and regret about what we might have purchased, but really face tomorrow about how to solve it. And if you or someone you know is struggling, you know, there are things you can do. You can learn about these income-based plans. You can figure out how to avoid default and the consequences of default. You can file a complaint with the CFPB if your lender or servicer you think is not playing by the rules. But the key is, is not to run away. Don't hide from the envelopes, but take action. And most importantly, help each other. That when you hear someone who might be having a problem, make sure that they confront it and rather than run away. And so, you know, I look forward to um, hearing more about not just the one solution, but the many solutions that you all come up with. And this is not a problem that is going to go away, and it's going to take all of us, federal government, state level, and individual students, to fix all of this. So thanks for having me, and uh, I look forward to your questions. <laughs> How do you think the next budget travel can affect what you think are the best predictions of the community when our Pell Grant a lot of talks about that? So, you know, I to be perfectly honest, I uh, we are financial regulators and so we kind of spend most of our time overseeing banks and and that make sure they're following the law. But there's no question that uh, funding for kind of the key grant programs will ultimately have a real impact on student indebtedness for people. Um, you know, there's, there's, I, I think the market, individuals, and even regulators, we can, can't really predict what Congress will do. Well, so l labor costs of uh, institution are obviously a very, very large portion in, of, of many, many colleges and universities. So, you know, I think there's always a question of how do you have attract the right type of faculty administrators that you want um, and, and how you get a fair price for them. Now, there's no question that not only has tuition risen very rapidly, but also you know, the data would show that uh, many salaries of uh, certain college employees has also ra uh, grown very rapidly. And it's actually not very inconsistent with what we see in uh, the broader private sector, where you see the variance between uh, top earners at publicly traded uh, corporations have diverged quite a bit from, from the average employee. Uh, I actually, you know, I, my sense is that uh, kind of we always have to think carefully about price caps and things like that because there always can be unintended consequences. So, for example, 
when uh, there, in the tax code there are certain differences about how much you can deduct as a corporation for the high salaries of CEOs and what you actually see is instead of paying them in ways that are not deductible, it shifts to other types of compensation, such as different ways of stock options or other perquisites. So, you know, of course, figuring out labor costs, big piece of the cost of college, but, you know, I don't know if that specifically will, will do it, because there's always other ways to compensate. Yeah. One of the things that um, colleges across the nation are facing is the need to automate things in order to keep labor costs down so we can operate more efficiently. efficiently. And we are looking at issuing um, an RFP for refund services for our financial aid. Um, this is something PCC will be doing next year. It's something PSU will be doing shortly thereafter. Um, I know that there have been some concerns about some of the electronic refund models out there. So what advice would you give to our two institutions as we move forward with this? Yeah, so um, to give people some more background about this, for many, particularly for community colleges, a number of uh, students will actually have a greater amount of grants and scholarships and student loan proceeds than what they actually have to directly pay in tuition. So they have to use the rest for books or for living expenses, other things like that. Uh, on, for, so what, what she's asking is in order to cut costs, um, how can we process this quickly and maybe should we use some sort of third party provider? So you know, there's actually been a lot of problems uh, in this marketplace over the past six, seven years we've seen a number of really um, kind of poorly structured to be generous contracts between institutions of higher education and financial institutions. So in 2007, uh, the attorney, then Attorney General of New York, uh, Andrew Cuomo, uh, uncovered that there were student lenders who were offering kickbacks to schools and sometimes giving gifts to financial aid officials in exchange for putting that company on the preferred lender list. And in, that needed to be changed by law, and that's now banned. In 2009, Congress passed the CARD Act because there were real concerns about colleges accepting uh, sometimes incentive payments for when uh, students were being marketed credit cards on campus, and in some cases, those agreements gave bonuses to schools when students carried a balance. And so now there's new disclosure requirements that the credit card agreements now need to be made public. Uh, the, in the student loan space, there are obviously new codes of conduct, bans. And I think what we are finding is generally the in, in the market of the uh, refund services, for some providers, we actually, the bank regulators, reached a settlement with a large player called Hire One, where we uh, fined that entity for unfair and deceptive practices and actually found that they were charging multiple insufficient funds fees. Um, and, and there's always questions about whether students realize, one, what is the school, uh, how is the school benefiting? How is the student benefiting? And really, how does the financial transaction work? And do, is it very transparent as to how uh, the student can choose a lower cost option, like getting a direct deposit or some other free way to access their funds? So you know, in terms of a best practice, we recognize, and we recently held a public forum on this, that there seemed to be some unanimity about uh, amongst college officials and, and students and consumer groups that making those agreements public um, and, and clear to the university community, one, that can increase confidence 
in whether those contracts were appropriately negotiated, but also there is a lot of consensus that the, the choice needs to be very clear, that students can clearly access and give their direct deposit information well in advance before they need to be offered some sort of prepaid card or debit card. So you know, it's something you should be very careful about. Of course, an RFP is a good idea, but institutions can face huge risk um, when they partner with financial institutions that break the law. We have time for maybe one more. Let me wait for that. Yeah. I guess just along the topic of financial malfeasance, I wondered what correlations maybe you've seen um, with the LIBOR implications with higher ed and if there was anything in particular that you saw around um, maybe the solutions piece. I know that there's some organizations and universities that have sought to recoup funds from this and if you have seen maybe in your office um, any tidbits that you could share about um, the future of where that is going? Yes, yeah, so to, to, to be frank, the, the issue of LIBOR and how it may, have, may or may not have been manipulated is, is a little outside our purview, but generally speaking, um, the downward manipulation of LIBOR would have actually helped student loan borrowers if, they were, if their loans were tied to that rate. Now, I think a number of universities may have been involved in certain bond issuances where they had to make certain types of payments depending on how the index moved. You know, that, again, I, I apologize, that's a little bit outside of our area of expertise, but I think the broader point is that transparency in the financial services market, you know, when we don't have that transparency, it can have all sorts of unintended consequences, and often there's a lot of negative consequences of that. All right, guys, I think that's all we have time for. Thank you so much. All right, this is the time when we're going to split up and solve this problem once and for all, right? I wish, huh? Um, you have your choice of which group you'd like to go to, depending on what you're drawn to and where you think you have the most to offer. So one of them is what can colleges do Okay, I'm looking for the college one. That one's the college one? Okay. It doesn't say college. University administration. All right. What can they do? That's led by uh, Jackie Balzer, PSU, Vice President for Enrollment Management and Student Affairs. Also, what can students do over here? And that will be led by Emma Calloway, the executive director of the Oregon Student Association, and Raylene McMillan, who you met earlier, the director of University Affairs. So what can the legislature and state policymakers do? The state is right over here. <clears throat> That'll be with Mary King, Portland State University economics professor, and Debbie Koreski, PSU director of state government relations. And finally, <clears throat> what can Congress and federal policymakers do? I think we could have stopped it. What can Congress do? That'll be led by Ryan Mann, field rep for the Office of Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici, and Mary Muller, PSU Director of Local and Federal Government Relations. So what you're going to do is get together, <clears throat> come up with like, you know, three really good recommendations about what you'd like to see happen what you think is possible, and then we'll meet back in a half an hour and hear about them, see what comes up. I think we'll go ahead and get started with um, what can colleges do. So Jackie Balzer, PSU Vice President for Enrollment Management and Student Affairs, I'm going to invite you up here. And if we can have everyone else's attention, we're going to hear some of the recommendations. Yes, please. Just because they'll hear you better if you're just right here. So take it away. Sure. We had a lively um, group of students and administrators uh, who were talking about what can colleges do. And we generated well over um, probably 40, I would guess, ideas. Uh, but they fell into three categories. Our three categories included 
early mandatory personalized financial literacy and coaching that all of us agree that we need to continue to simplify information um, and help students or prospective students or pre-college students make informed decisions and that it can't just be left to chance and that uh, Lane Community College implemented a program this year where they required a financial literacy mo a module um, and they're seeing a difference in the decisions that students are making for the good uh, around loans. So that was one category. The second category is around the area of controlling costs and helping students control their costs and the university controlling their costs. So um, that was the bucket that included things like helping students find jobs, um, possibly even us looking at the university of what are some of our activities that could be turned into student employment um, so that we could help a student have sort of an internship, a work experience, and pay for college. How is it we need to keep looking inward and controlling costs um, in the work that we do, especially those non-instructional costs um, that we continue to look at the price of books and housing and student fees and, and all the associated costs for our students, knowing that that certainly is, is leading to debt. Um, there was even an idea of could recent grads um, use some of the educational award type programs to help pay off some of their debt um, by coming back. Uh, it was a student that generated this idea, coming back and mentoring other students um, as a way to relieve some of their debt. And we've seen that obviously work very well with AmeriCorps and, and VISTA educational awards. So I thought that was a really good one. The, the third bucket is um, looking uh, inward again at the universities um, as a, a actually um, high schools, community colleges, and four years as a system and building pathways that are seamless, that are efficient, looking at curriculum and removing um, uh, barriers to being on track, on time via curriculum planning, um, articulation agreements, quality front end advising, um, that we absolutely need to ensure that students can graduate in three years, four years, um, and get in and get out and get on with careers. So those were our three buckets. Excellent. Thank you. It's amazing how much you guys can get done in a half an hour. My gosh. Okay, next we're, next we're going to hear what can students do, and I'd like to invite Emma Calloway, the Executive Director of the Oregon Student Association, up to let us know what you guys were thinking about. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's nice to see you. Uh, we talked about a number of topics with the students, and um, the three main categories are simple systems that get the word out, um, simplifying systems, simpli simplifying financial aid, um, simplifying the way that we go through, the way that we pay tuition, the way that we pay for textbooks, um, and also maybe possibly spending a little bit less time at orientation worrying about the socialization of young people and worrying more about the orientation of us towards a more complex financial system. Um, and I think that that's a really important shift that, you know, colleges and universities are needing to move much further past fun dorm life and that we are in a new generation of higher ed. And I, I thought that was a fruitful discussion. Um, the second was to lower, lower costs and include students in the financial decisions of the institution. We are the best indicators of what we can afford. And if you are going to decide what to do with our money, then we are asking to be part of the table um, and part of the decision making body. And lastly, we talked extensively about advocacy and the importance for the difficult decisions our institutions are making all the time in relation to how to spend limited dollars, and that what we really need to be spending our time on is collectively administrators and legislators and students together um, asking the state for more funding and re returning back to a day where the state actually invested in higher education in a real way. And we know that Oregon has managed to keep tuition costs 
lower in this state than in other states because of the way that students and admin um, come together to ask for more state funding and to be on the same side of tuition caps and to really be talking about affordability in a meaningful way. So we want to continue to do that um, as we move forward. So advocacy is something we spent a considerable amount of time on and you can definitely hear, for, at least from the student side, that that will not be stopping anytime soon. So thank you. Nothing will change unless you speak up, so definitely go for it. Okay, what can the legislature and state policymakers do? Mary King, Portland State University economics professor, I'm hoping will come up and uh, share some of the things you guys came up with. Thanks a lot. We had the great fortune of having a very highly engaged group, a lot of people who are already working hard on this issue. And so I can tell you about a few of the initiatives that can benefit from people's talking about, supporting, improving over the next few years. We heard from Michael Salvaggio about the, uh, from the Treasurer's Office about the Oregon Opportunity Initiative, which will be bringing a ballot in November. Essentially, this will allow the state to bond not only for physical capital purposes, but to invest in human capital. So it is the start of creating a permanent endowment fund that could better fund the Oregon Opportunity Grant, pay it forward, or other higher ed initiatives. We heard from Michael Dembro, who carried the pay it forward legislation about the progress of that and his and the legislature's strong commitment to doing just what Emma just called for, really trying to move the state back into a position of responsibility for public higher education, and that this is part of a larger project which we're really all going to have to pay attention to of effective tax reform in this state. We need to find stable funding as a main goal of that tax reform. We were able to hear from Rob Saxton, who talked about the importance of students arriving on campus ready to take advantage of public higher ed so that they were not paying tuition to take developmental classes and other sorts of initiatives that focus on high school. And then Bob Brew at the Oregon Opportunity Grant, who are looking for ways to uh, reach fewer students, since currently that fund reaches only 20% of the eligible students. We need far more funding there, and is working with the Higher Ed Coordinating Committee on a number of possible tweaks to change incentives. And we brainstormed just a little bit about how we can really shift back toward a more shared model of responsibility for public higher education and shift that burden off student back to the broader society. and. As we do it, decrease the volatility of funding from pi to public higher ed, which has such large costs secondary to the amount of funding. So thanks a lot. Thank you. And finally, what can Congress and federal policymakers do? And uh, I'd like to invite Ryan Mann, for, uh, the field rep from Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici's office to come up and share what they were working on. Thank you. So um, we had kind of a small group over on the federal side and I don't blame people for being skeptical of Congress's role and being a part of the solution given what we've seen recently. Um, something I shared with our group. Um, the latest numbers I saw said uh, public approval of Congress as a whole is at 5%, and people often say, holy cow, that's a historically low number, um, it's so low, and I actually see that and say one in 20 people think Congress is doing a good job right now. I think that number is sort of startlingly, is starting, <laughs> I'm startled by how high that number is, and um, I, uh, I work for a member of Congress, and I'm not satisfied with how it's going, my boss isn't satisfied with how it's going. Um, but I, sh I share that because I think there's actually an opportunity because if we're not at the bottom, then we're pretty darn close to the dysfunction and, and how bad things are. And I think there's a lot of hunger for um, bipartisan solutions. And so maybe, just maybe, and this is me being optimistic and having a glass half full, but um, maybe the timing is right for the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act. Um, right when people are demanding some bipartisan solutions, maybe we can come together and um, do some productive things uh, in the education realm. 
My boss serves on the education committee in the U.S. House and is on the subcommittee focused on higher education. Um, so she will have a front seat to some of those uh, discussions. And um, in our group, we talked about what the focus should be during reauthorization. And there's um, a couple kind of big picture and then one more specific. Um, big picture is just a general um, making higher education a priority in the federal budget. We, we talked about how discretionary spending is often what gets cut when Congress makes cuts and education falls into that discretionary spending. It's already a very small chunk and things like sequestration and um, potential cuts down the road will only make that sliver even smaller. Um, so in general, prioritizing education in the federal budget, because as we've heard from everyone today, um, it's really a, a public good that's good for the whole country and it should be prioritized in the budgeting process. So that's one big picture. The second is just protecting existing programs like Pell and Perkins. Um, we could certainly do more in those realms, but the first step is making sure that further cuts aren't made to financial aid programs that um, are the only thing that are allowing a lot of students to access higher education. So let's make sure that we're protecting those programs. Um, and then finally, a more specific solution. Um, uh, some of the students in our group discussed the need for more flexibility in the income equation on the FAFSA form when you're reporting your, your income if you're filing as an individual or your family's income for the previous year, it doesn't necessarily reflect your ability to pay um, in a future year. And so um, while there is an ability to adjust that, it's difficult for students to do in our current um, regime. So maybe taking a look at the, um, at the FAFSA process and that income equation so that students are actually getting the assistance that they need in the year that they're attending college. So those were our three solutions. And let's stay optimistic about Congress, and we'll, uh, we'll work hard to do our part. Thank you. Well, great recommendations, and I want to assure you that they're not just going to be left on the tables here. Those recommendations will be put together and then delivered to appropriate representatives in the areas that they address. Uh, we want them to see what you've worked on today and, and take to heart what you'd like to see done and how it can be done. I think the thing I walked away with today is that um, a better understanding that you know, higher education is not just for the student or the family or the university. It really impacts everyone so directly in our economy and in our country. And, uh, you know, Dale, I'm with him. I think, I think you need to, you need it. You need it to think and create and become a, a better country than we are today. So um, I appreciate the perspectives that you all gave today. If you'd like to stay, next up is a workshop on financial aid that really focuses on Oregon. So I'd, the rest of you, if you're taking off, I'd like to thank you for being here today. It, it's going to take a lot of voices, really loud voices, to bring about change. And I appreciate hearing your voices today. And, and I hope we hear some great things in the weeks to come. Thank you.